This and I'll conference just will now be recorded. If you're not uh, speaking, just to mute yourself so we can cut down on the background noise. Thank you. Well, some of us will still mute ourselves when we are speaking, so that'll really cut down on some of the, <laughs> the noise. Uh, it's nine o'clock. I'll call the meeting to order. And uh, I'm having some issues with uh, the new laptop the county gave me, so I'm back to the iPad and I can't see everybody. So speak up if uh, if we do have uh, if you do have any questions or comments, and we'll we'll figure it out from there. Um, was Lindsay? Is there anyone for open forum? Uh, no, Mayor Woodbury. No one signed up for open forum. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, confirmation of the agenda as amended, moved by Barbara, seconded by Martin. Any discussion on that? Barbara? See? You're muted still. That's because I'm on the phone as well. Thank you. So I'll be the first tonight to, today to get it out of the way. Uh, you're yeah. muted. Uh, the insurance, uh, the staff report with regard to the insurance premium, should we be moving that forward while we have our friends here? Would it, would it, is it necessary or would it be worthwhile? Sure. What number is that one? Oh, it's gosh. In it's oh, in, is it in, it's in consent, so it's not one that we're... Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we'll leave Just that. Leave it where it is then. Thank yep. you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, not hearing anyone else. Is anyone opposed to uh, the motion? And that is carried. Uh, any declaration of pecuniary interest? Declare now or at any time through the meeting, and then send Lindsay a note with on the form that she made up or somebody made up. And then we move into <coughs> delegations, and uh, we have uh, Deb and Tony here to uh, to de delegate to us uh, about how we're getting that big reduction in our uh, premiums for insurance. Um, see, I, I can keep trying that just to see, but uh, sometime I'll be right in the future. Uh, so it's uh, the motion's moved by Jason and seconded by Jim. So I don't know, Deb or Tony, which one of you like to go, or both at the same time, or whatever you like. I'll take I'll that to pleasure, start. Your <laughs> hey, Tony, you want to say hi, Debbie? <laughs> hi, guys. Thanks for uh, letting us in and join your meeting this morning. Perfect. No, thank you, Your Worship and Council, for this opportunity to address you all today. Um, I do see a lot of familiar faces, but uh, for those of you who I haven't met in person, my name is Tony Camiso and I work for Intact Public Entities, uh, formerly known as Frank Cowan Company. Our company has been in business for over 90 years, providing insurance programs for municipalities and other public entities. Uh, Intact Insurance purchased Frank Cowan Company in 2019. Uh, we are currently in the middle of a rebrand, so you know our logo and name has changed, uh, has officially changed now. And before I get into all the wonderful news about municipal insurance. I just wanted everybody on council to know that while we do have a new owner, the fundamental product and services that we've always provided to municipalities has not changed. Municipal insurance is still our bread and butter. Uh, we still have the same management team that we had even before the purchase. Um, and Intact has actually added 19 new people to our staff since 2019. And I think that's very important for you to know because with so much change happening in our lives these days, at least when it comes to your insurance, it's still the same team of people that are helping you and the same team of people that are helping staff that our staff have come accustomed to dealing with, uh, including, um, and of course, Debbie's here from, from NFP uh, down in Dundalk and Debbie works really closely with staff to ensure that all your assets are up to date and that we have all the correct information when we are preparing uh, you know, the insurance report. So your worship, I, I wanna break my presentation down into basically three parts. Uh, number one, I wanna talk about what's going on in the market. Number two, I wanna talk about Southgate's individual insurance renewal. And then number three, I wanna talk about how the township can potentially offset some of these increases. 
Uh, unfortunately, it's not a decrease this year, but I really do hope I can come one day and, and talk about decreases. So the first one is, you know, why are municipal insurance rates skyrocketing? And the primary reason that I'm even here today uh, speaking to council because it's it's getting a little bit out of control. And now municipalities in Ontario and Canada are seeing their annual insurance rates skyrocket. It's we're now in the second year of, of double digit increases. And I think there's two reasons. So one of them is because insurance markets are in fact cyclical. So there are soft markets and hard markets. And the soft markets are when you have 12 or 15 different insurance companies who are going to be trying to write your business. So you'll see low premiums, low deductibles, high levels of coverage and capacity. Whereas the hard market is the very opposite. You have insurance companies that are very strict on what they underwrite, how much they underwrite it for, and how much coverage they provide. And hard markets from a historical point of view have occurred basically every decade, once every decade, or in, uh, starting in the 70s. So it happened once in the 70s, again in the 80s, and then we saw it in the early 2000s. They last about three to four years, and then you have this soft market that comes in to really balance things out. We just came out of a very unusually long soft market which ended in around the middle of 2019. So right now we're in the middle of what insurance people call this hard market. So what's causing it? And that leads me to my second point of, it's basically the cost of claims and the continued escalation of the cost of claims. That document I shared with staff um, and council, that document, I think, it's, I think it's eight or 12 page, I can't remember, but it's filled with all the data and the statistics that you know, you know, help me explain this point. So I just want to take a few timbits from there to just really amplify the point that we were trying to make. And that is, as a society, we're showing this trend that we have become much more litigious and we have much less personal accountability, which has resulted in higher, higher frequency of claims and higher severity of claims. So in result, judges are awarding much more contributory negligence towards municipalities versus plaintiffs. So damage warrants uh, are being are substantial now. A number of years ago, it'd be shocking to hear about a $5 million liability award, while today they're just much more frequent. Court awards for bodily injury claims have increased significantly in the last 10 years. Claims that used to settle for just a few million dollars are now settling for double. And a lot of those costs are funded on the fact that it's future care that we're, we're providing payments for. Future care for catastrophic catastrophically injured plaintiffs really so municipalities have a large exposure for this type of loss and they're seeing the impact through the cost of insurance now the cost of defending a claim is also going up individual claims are much more complex to defend resulting in much more time to manage which inco includes more detailed investigations uh, you got more experts needed more legal time involved in the process again at ever increasing rates uh, property losses have become much more frequent and severe. Climate change has resulted in substantial increase in property losses, uh, regardless of if weather has impacted your individual municipality or not. The, the escalation of the cost of those claims for both property and reinsurance rates are affecting it worldwide. So insurers have statistically seen more weather-related losses than ever before. And this is a statistic that I wanted to share with council. It's also in that report, but seven of the top 10 most significant weather-related losses have actually happened in the last 10 years. So that's, that's what the insurance companies are dealing with right now. They're dealing with a heck of a lot more claims that cost a heck of a lot more than they ever have, and it's all happened in the last 10 years. So between 2009 and 2019, the country was averaging about $1.9 billion annually in insured losses. And the decades before that, from 1983 to 2008, the average yearly total was 422 million. So huge difference in those two decades in terms of costs that insurers are paying out. Uh, the last issue I wanted to bring up uh, on my first point was that historically, insurance companies would invest the premiums and make money on those premiums through the investment market. Well, returns on investments, um, although they are still trending okay they're not as much as insurance companies have historically gotten so they're getting poor results 
from earned premiums, you have combining that with an escalating more claims and, and cost of claims, and the insurers are now forced to increase their rates. So this leads me to the second point, your worship, which is how does this affect Southgate's personal insurance renewal? So we have another double digit adjustment here in the forecast and the current municipal insurance rate increase throughout the province is actually trending towards 30% this year. That's a scary number, I know. Um, Southgate is just under 35% and in one word, it's, it's because of claims. Um, your individual claims performance has actually deteriorated for the third straight year. Uh, so that's a very scary trend for our insuring partners and why they were forced to increase your premiums again this year. Your loss ratio today is actually double what it was in 2019. So is that bad? Yes, but it's actually common, believe it or not, for a lot of municipalities. So there are a lot of municipalities who are in the same boat that are having these double digit increases uh, come across their desks. My third and final point, your worship is what can the township do to help offset these increases? And for that, it's two words, it's risk management. It's been 20 years since the insurance industry has seen inflated rates like this. And it's 10 years overdue if you ask uh, people who have been in the insurance industry longer than I have. Um, like I said, this the last time this type of rate inflation happened was in the early 2000s. So these rate increases are are coming no matter what. And I think the best solution for any municipality or, or any risk is how do you actively migrate the losses? How do you move claims away from happening? So this, uh, this means you have to continue to send us agreements and contracts to review. Anytime there's a project, you know, staff and, and council need to consider, well, what are the liability implications? Is there an insurance clause within this agreement protecting the municipality? And asking questions like that are very important as it prevents claims from ever even happening. And our team uh, can review those situations, can review that material, and we can advise the municipality on how to proceed. Preventing claims will only help the municipality's overall loss ratio and make an immediate impact um, on your rating. So I encourage uh, council and staff to remain very risk adverse. Don't shy away from asking questions from your suppliers your contractors and other parties that you're entering into agreements with. And I really do hope that everyone on council is taking advantage of our free webinars uh, that we've been providing uh, since the pandemic was declared. Uh, most of you will know that we've always, our company has always participated at every major municipal conference. Uh, we used to use those opportunities to provide in-person risk management training education sessions. Uh, and we will do so once we are able, but for the for foreseeable future, please, uh, I encourage all of you, register for those webinars and continue to educate yourselves on how to reduce those claims, um, both in terms of frequency and severity. Um, that's basically the gist of my presentation, Your Worship. I, I know there's gonna be some questions, so I wanna make sure there's enough time for, for that as well. And I do thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay. Um, I was going to say thank you, and uh, I, I think I still will, but uh, with uh, with that type of news, um, it's it's never good news for any of us. So, but thank you for uh, coming in and and uh, giving this presentation and the explanations. It puts, uh, I know it puts all of us, uh, you guys and us, in uh, awkward situations at times. Uh, are there any questions from Council? Brian. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tony and Deb, for being here this morning. It's always a pleasure to see both of you. Um, <clears throat> Tony, in your presentation, you talked about the township's loss ratio, and I'm just wondering how much uh, our rate relies on that loss ratio as opposed to the loss ratio of municipal municipalities, uh, uh, you know, in aggregate. And what are those loss ratios, if you don't mind me asking? Great question. And the the current loss ratio that the township has is 105%. So this means for every dollar that the municipality has paid in the last six years, a dollar five has been paid out in insurance claims. Um, so that's not good. The the insurers no. are 
are, are not profitable at all in that sense. That number, just so everyone is aware, we need that loss ratio to be in the 60% range in order for the insurers to break even. So that's the issue we have right now. Um, how does it affect your individual performance? Well, if the average municipal increase is, is around 30% and you guys are 5% over, I'd say it's affecting at least 5%, if not maybe close to 10% of the rate increase is because of your individual claim performance. The rest of it, I say, is driven by the current market and the struggles that the insurers are having. Right. And if I could, Mr. Mayor, I have another. Sure. Um, I just I, I wanted to say, I guess if misery loves company, we should be happy because, as you say, everybody's getting hammered with this. And and I see it in other markets as well. You mentioned in your report uh, or in your written report, the joint and several liability issue. Where are we at with that? I mean, the current government had committed to really having a run at that and we've seen nothing. And I'm not surprised, but I'm just wondering if you had any comments on that. <clears throat> Go ahead. Thank you. No, great question. Um, yeah, we did have a lot of momentum for quite a while there. And then it just, it really got put on the back burner. I think when COVID hit, where are we right now? We're still lobbying. We're still trying. We're the only insurance company that's financially supporting that momentum. I have seen numerous resolutions to council where municipalities are asking the provincial government to address that issue. Where where does it sit on Mr. Ford's uh, agenda or plate? I don't know. I I I. And that's what I really miss about the conferences is because when you're in those bear pits, you can ask those questions directly to those provincial leaders and they, they got to answer because you got 300 people looking at you. And but I can tell you from from the company's perspective, we're not letting it go away. We are still pushing. We are still trying uh, and we will not let it just just vanish. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Good. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, anyone else with any questions or comments? Barbara. Okay, Barbara. Hello again, through you, uh, Mayor Woodbury. Uh, there was, uh, I had the question that Brian had about the loss ratio. When you indicate that our claims have doubled since 2019, does that mean we had one and now we have two or we had four and now we have eight and what would those claims be that we are continuing to um, incur those added settlements? I mean without divulging any you know personal or private information just in general. Absolutely uh, another great question and, and through you your wordship uh, I can't speak to the specifics of the claims um, in total Currently, the township has three open matters that we're dealing with, and it's not so much the number of claims, it's the the cost of the claims. So severity. Very, yeah, the severity of, of the losses. We had a very large fleet loss a couple of years ago that we settled that claim at $334,000. So that's about right. triple what the township is paying. So that's going to skew your numbers right away. We've also had a few liability issues come up. Um, and the liability policy, the general liability policy, is the most triggered policy on any municipal program. So it's not a shock to us by any means. But we had one particular matter that unfortunately took uh, a little bit of a left turn at trial. And we thought we were we were going to be able to close it this year, but we weren't able to. So that particular matter is still open. It's still in, in court and it actually doubled in reserve activity. So our reserve is the fund that the insurance company has to legally set aside to pay for a claim. We have to set aside funds to pay for the claim. So our examiner has to determine, okay, now that because that particular claim didn't go in our favor, and we're having some issues with it, we now have to put more money into the reserve to potentially offset another year of battling it out in the court. So that particular claim 
seen a hundred thousand dollar reserve increase again that's a lot of money so again you don't have a lot of claims it's just the claims you have had unfortunately are very severe which is again it's not just southgate it's happening to a lot of townships across the province we're seeing it on the east coast on the west coast and you know i wish i had a better solution than to just increase the rate but it's it's literally a money issue and, and the reserves are going up and that that's what's causing it right um, thank you and just one more and maybe this question is more for liam um there was a reference and i'm and i'm forgive me if this is in liam's report um but it refers to there was also a correction for understated prior year premiums now was that something that intact understated or did we not anticipate something i'm just i'm curious if that's affecting or or jacking up our 30 percent our 35 percent increase I'm not sure what that reference is hi liam if I'm being fair, for that uh, deb i think she probably has the more eloquent answer to on that one. Oh, is that the increase is the um that's the increase items on the automobile policy yes yes so your automobile fleet has unfortunately uh part of the increases on the automo automobile fleet um you have 30 automobiles and um they not that you've increased them much um your fleet has become newer as you guys know you've got new garbage trucks and you know new plow trucks new plows and, and sure yeah and all that stuff adds up um the value of what we're insuring um unfortunately i really feel it's unfortunate and it's not it seems that back in the frank cowan days um maybe the fleet didn't get priced correctly and now with everything that's happened to the file they've gone through it with a fine tooth comb and have you know clued in that the fleet rates were quite underpriced so uh, this year you're actually getting hit with with a correction on the fleet as well as the rate increase so it's kind of a double whammy um i have other fleets that have a lot less vehicles than what you guys have and they're paying more than what you are so you're still getting a great rate because you are a municipal if you look at the fleet um, i can send something to you showing what you're paying per vehicle and the rates are still pretty good on the vehicles you know with the vehicles being as expensive as they are the garbage trucks are over 300,000 as we all know for sure um, with, you know what I mean so that was part and parcel to the rate increases that the fleet I think um, finally got priced where it should be and there's no changing that unfortunately so the insurance company undervalued the premium not us we gave you the information no. you being Frank Cowan yes it was the insurance company they just their the rates were really really reasonable <laughs> i guess is what you'd say um and now i think you know even when we had the garbage truck loss your insurance did not go up where normally it would have um with most markets mm. uh, but anyway it didn't but, um, i guess i guess my question or my comment is is that if if an organization um quotes something for you know building a road or and and they're they go over and there isn't a contingency for them i mean a lot of companies would have to eat that mistake uh, and and not pass that on but um the insurance company one way or the other is going to get passed on i just wanted to clarify that this is this is the frank cowan mistake intact has has reviewed the files and has decided to um oh we didn't charge you enough five years ago so we're gonna we're gonna add it add it to your premium this year it's good for our residents to understand that um yes. when we we go forward and and this year is going to be a difficult year when we have to raise property taxes to cover you know things that are out of our control so thanks very much for the explanation i, re I really do appreciate that clarity and I mean, the other side of it is you had you had an excellent rate on your auto fleet for many years. You know, that's the other yeah. side of the coin. It's it's just caught we, up we, with us. We saved, but it's catching up. Thanks. It's catching up now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds to me an awful lot like uh, 
property assessment. It, it is what it is until it's looked into and reassessed, and then you find out what you really need to pay. Tony, you had uh, comments to add. Just one comment, Your Worship, on the fleet. Um, the other thing we have to factor in is that in 2019, uh, we the municipality lost their their fleet no claims uh discount you know a lot of you will know if you have personal auto if you have no claims you you get a, a surcharge or or a percentage off your your premium so yes the rates were discounted but they were also claims free on the fleet policy and that all changed in 2019 so when the claim did finalize uh in at the end of 2020 i believe it wouldn't be reflected until this renewal because you guys renew in october so it's it's a timing issue. It was a, a very discounted rate issue, but again, it's uh, sometimes these things just take time to roll out. So I just again, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Any Follow other up? questions or comments? Follow uh, up, Mayor. Oh, okay. Just, Jim has a, a a question, and then we'll get back to you, Barb. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, well, you made mention of a claim by the police against the township. Doesn't the police look after their own? I'm sorry, Jim, can you repeat that? Tony mentioned that the police had a claim against the township. I think the number was 300,000. No, oh. mm. that, was, that was the garbage truck loss. So where do the, the police fire. get involved in I, I, Tony? No, I think he just misunderstood what I said, that's all. I, I don't see anything in here involving police. No. Okay. Uh, Barb? Just to, through you to Tony, Tony, you mentioned that we lost our no claims discount. How many years of no claims um, would we ha would we uh, go through in order to get that no claims discount back? Just curious. You know, like when you get a speeding ticket, it's three or five years until it comes off your off your uh, your record. What? How do we get that back? Good question. Through your worship. Mm -hmm. We use a 10-year loss history, so it take 10 years to have no claims on your, and this is only your fleet policy I'm referencing, so 10 years it would take. Okay, okay. thank you. Any other questions or comments? Martin. Thank you, John. Through the chair, this could be for Deborah or Tony. We've uh, talked about one or two severe claims obviously in court, and we've talked about the fleet. Is there anything else the township could do in other areas to bring the premium down? Like you've mentioned uh, climate change, cyber liability. Is there anything we could do to, uh, you know, you're talking about risk liability. Uh, is there anything that we can do in risk liability management of our buildings or retrograding them to weather these 100 storms that are, 100 year storms that are coming every five years? That kind of thing. Is there anything else where we can save, basically? Another great question, and and through you, your worship, uh, Intact actually just announced, I think yesterday or the day before, they're going to donate up to a million dollars to any Canadian municipality who comes up with flood migration or climate change initiatives within your municipality. So if you're going to retrofit a building or you're going to find ways to offset potential property losses, your municipality could qualify for a grant. And that information was just sent out yesterday, so it, it might not even have made it um, to your staff yet. I, it was sent via email, so it, it should be circulating out this week. So there are some grants that are going to become available for the municipality in the very near future. In terms of other ways to reduce your loss, you're right. Um, continue to migrate liability situations by asking the right questions and having us review agreements. But we, we can talk about increasing your deductibles, which would mean you have to 
incur more costs on, on some claims. But the disadvantage right now is that you're not going to get a good credit or you're not going to get good savings on increasing your deductibles right now. Next year or the year after, I think we can have a, a very good discussion about it because the insurance companies right now, they need the rate. And if you increase your deductibles, they're not going to get their rate. So you're not going to be able to get the savings that uh, that you would you know feel entitled to at that time. So you know that's the only immediate impact I, I would see. It's really an attitude that everybody has to adhere to and, and it starts at council and trickles down to staff it's it's you know if you're doing something if you're doing a project okay how does this affect our insurance if there's a loss who's going to be responsible is it the contractor or is it us is it the supplier who's going to be responsible or is it us and if you can really prevent a lot of these issues from even coming up then you'll only see your insurance rate stabilize over time Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, thank you, Tony and Deb. Uh, Mayor mm -hmm. Oh, Councillor yep. Rice. Councillor Rice had a comment. Oh, okay. And Jason. Dave Milner. Okay. And then Dave. Go ahead, Jason. Um, uh, I guess I heard in there that we the last company had a discounted auto rate. Is that right? Yes. So you guys giving us the discount, your discounted auto rate then? Go ahead. You, your word, Chip. Uh, no, we can't no longer because there's been some claim activity on the fleet policy. So there's there's no more uh, claims free discount there. So I guess I got a question maybe for Dave as well, if he's on the line. Um, yep. As counsel, should we not know about these big, uh, you know, these big claims and before this just comes to us, that there's going to be a 35% increase just like that. Like, it just seems out of the blue, or it's right here. We don't know nothing about them, and then here it is. I just wondered if we should be up to date on those a little more. Okay. Um, I think some of these we did know about with the, the truck. That was almost a couple of years ago, I guess, and, and things like that. But, Dave, if you'd like to comment, and you had some comments. Uh, address that question is um, our auditors uh, evaluate that every year and get reports from uh, uh, lawyers and and uh, um, the Cowan company previously and and uh, now uh, in in their intact uh, position but we uh, get reports from that as well as we do report to council on the big ones the smaller ones that are more litigious in nature and um, we don't usually report on until they become later on in the decision process but uh, um, that's something that uh, we keep track of through finance and uh, uh, address when we when we get decisions but there is maybe the question I have for Tony is maybe along these lines I mean we do have greater vulnerability because we have the beauty of highway 6 89 and 10 bordering on three sides of us uh, but that does come with increased risk, of course, with arteries onto major highways. Um, what part of, because we do get a lot of uh, what I would call uh, frivolous uh, action, what part of defending our positions without compensation is it compared to actually defending and paying out? Do you have information industry-wide or, or for Southgate on that issue? Go ahead, Tony. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I don't have that information in front of me today, Dave. Uh, great question, though. Um, you're right, though. Yeah, a lot of claims we do see are, in fact, frivolous. But I think that goes back to the whole point of we as a society have become much more litigious in the sense that these plaintiff lawyers are only getting the work and they take you know 60 70 percent of the settlement so they are continuing to really go after you know we call them the ambulance chasers right and you're right with the county roads all around you there are some significant accidents on those roads and sometimes they trickle onto the township roads so yeah you're, you're always going to have a target on you um, i just don't have a breakdown in terms of the financial impact on 
we can break it down on a spreadsheet in terms of how much legal fees are being paid out versus what the damage award the judges are paying out. Like I can provide you that, but only for Southgate. I can't share what other no, municipalities no. pay for confidentiality. Yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking more of a percentage basis, but I'm sure over likely 50% of the cost is defending position or more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's more. Yeah. Yeah. And and we see some pretty crazy attempts at getting money. So, I mean, anyway, it is what it is. Yeah. Any further questions or comments? Um, John, can I just... Uh make a comment no okay yes <laughs> i just want to go back to the fleet for one minute um so the 2019 garbage truck that was purchased after the loss is only last year your premium on that garbage truck for one year was 1265 dollars so when you when you see your fleet going up the way it has you need to understand you have 30 vehicles, you have high priced vehicles. The fire trucks are a good example of high, high priced vehicles. You have the coverage that if they're um, new, you get the replacement cost. So they're gonna buy you a new garbage truck again if something happens here. Um, with a fleet policy, it's always been my uh, opinion that if it's profitable, the rates will be lower. But as soon as it becomes unprofitable, that's when your rates are gonna go up. So if you're paying $27,000 on a fleet, and you have a $350,000 loss, you can see where the issue is with, with the unprofitable part of it. So I just wanted to add all that in. It's, you know, when you look at a, a fleet at 40,000, you do have 30 vehicles. So it kind of, you know, it's still not per vehicle. You're still not paying what the normal Joe would be paying out on the street. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Deb. Uh, anyone else? Okay, not hearing anyone. Uh, Tony and Deb, thank you very much for uh, coming in and it's always great talking to you. And I too look forward to seeing everybody in person again at uh, some point in our lives. So uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Very much. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Yes, see you around. <laughs> yep. Uh, so the motion we have here is to receive presentation, and it was moved by Jason, seconded by uh, uh, Jim. Uh, any further discussion on that? Okay, hearing none, anyone opposed? And that is carried. Uh, next, we have uh, a, a presentation by JLL uh, JL Canada. That's uh, uh, Adam and uh, Kathy. So with uh, You'd like to go ahead. Welcome. It's very quiet. Do you know Lindsay or Terry if they're on the line? There they are. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. I didn't couldn't find the buttons. We finished the presentation. Are there any questions? <laughs> Sorry about that. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Your Worship, uh, Council, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your time uh, this morning. We really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Adam Sheriff Scott. I am one of three uh, industrial leads for uh, Jones Lang LaSalle JLL here in Ontario. Uh, and I run our, our office uh, in Mississauga, which I've been doing from my basement for the last two years. So it's actually nice to be in our office uh, this morning although socially distanced. Um, we are here on behalf of uh, JLL to discuss the, uh, the Echo Park project in Dundalk. Um, we prepared a presentation that I believe was submitted to you about a week ago. Our thought um, for this morning was to go through high level, um, a discussion on the, on the property and the analysis that we've done, uh, talk about some sort of, uh, some of the competitive market comparables, you know, to, to give guidance on pricing, and then talk about uh, our company and how we would propose uh, the, the marketing strategy and, and, and disposing of this to, to sort of maximize, you know, transparency, uh, efficiency, and, and then obviously uh, proceeds. So um, 
again, we're not going to cover every page in this, but we're happy at any point if someone, you know, it's it's really meant to be interactive, which is which is tough virtually. If anyone has a question um, or you feel we haven't covered something enough, please, please interrupt me or, or, or Kathy um, because we want to make sure you're getting everything out of this. There's a lot of information here, um, but we wanted to make sure that you had all of the information uh, available to us uh, to help you make the best decision. So does that, uh, your worship council, does that, does that work for everybody on the, uh, on the call? Yep. Sounds good. Excellent. Uh, j just quickly about the company. Uh, we are a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. We were founded in 1798, I believe. So all this, uh, a realty services firm in the world. Uh, currently we have, it's actually closer to a hundred thousand employees. This, this slide is a little dated, uh, in over 80 countries and, um, We've got 300 plus uh, offices worldwide. Um, as it relates to Canada, which is which is a little more, uh, you know, what we need to be talking about. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, no. Frozen. Ah. There. Okay. Uh, so we've got uh, it's actually 10 corporate offices. We just opened a new one in uh, Kitchener Waterloo uh, two months ago. Um, and we've got uh, now closer to 1,600 uh, employees uh, coast to coast. We also have affiliate offices in uh, Regina, affiliate offices in Winnipeg and in Halifax as well. So excellent coverage uh, throughout Canada uh, for all of our clients. So uh, we'll jump into the property profile. Just uh, you guys know the property you, you have been uh, involved in the planning stages of this, but uh, just to cover it, we have 142 acres of land uh, that uh, is available, uh, but 32 of it would be highway commercial along the Highway 10, and then the remainder would be uh, industrial land that would be available for uh, users and developers. Um, the services will be available uh, based on our discussions and our knowledge uh, sometime next year along with the road and uh, in order for us to be able to I guess benefit from uh, how we market the property our recommendation is to uh, put this on the market unpriced and we will discuss shortly the um, the comps that are available and you will see that those are all over the place um, and I'll jump into that in a second. But uh, in terms of zoning, we have two different zoning uh, uh, for the, the 142 acres. We have the commercial, highway commercial zone, uh, and then we have the general industrial zone. Our recommendation, and based on uh, some feedback I received from Terry, um, is that you guys are looking to uh, work on, on making changes to the zoning bylaw um, and we definitely recommend revisiting it and adding some additional uh, both industrial and commercial uses uh, that would be allowed in this part. Uh, in terms of us, uh, the Scott's analysis, um, in terms of the strengths, uh, you know, great location along Highway 10, uh, great connectivity uh, to Greater Toronto area and some of the other uh, major markets in Ontario. Um, the park will have both commercial and industrial uh, land, uh, service land, which is great because there's a lot of land available in Ontario that is not serviced. Um, and then you have a, a really strong pool of uh, growing uh, residential, which will provide for labor. Uh, and that's a, a, a huge one in Ontario right now with all the labor shortages uh, across the province, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Kathy. I think the, the number one uh, challenge we have with all of our clients um, in industrial is, is labor. So I, I think that, um, you know, the fact that the, the residential development is going on is a really key um, success factor that we would want to market very heavily. Uh, effectively, the question we get asked by all of our industrial clients is who's going to work in my warehouse? So uh, and I guess the, one of the other sort of challenges just in, in Gray County is that there is, um, you know, there is a bit of a shortage of industrial land. So I think that this, this having this, you know, 100, 100 acres of an industrial and then the, the 42 of, of commercial is a real benefit uh, 
to 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 you, to you all, uh, your worship and, and council, so uh, for attracting jobs. Uh, so I think there is, you guys are not seeing a full screen, so, and I can't figure out how to change that. So um, is there anyone that can help me out? Oops, are you not able to see the screen that we're sharing right now? We can't see you. We'll Happy if you end, end your slideshow uh -huh. from there. And then if you go down to where your bottom right, bottom right of your screen, yeah, that one right there. Oh no, it's doing the same. Alicia, do you know? If you try and end the slideshow, Kathy, mm -hmm. and then go to view at the top of your screen. There used to be a button across the screen. Is it better if we show it this way? Can you see it better this way? Yeah, maybe like that. And then if you zoom your screen in a little bit. Okay. Um, the, we'll members also figure. Can, the members can also zoom their screen in too. Okay. I'm not sure why it's showing that way, but uh, just from uh, the perspective of opportunities, um, there, uh, over the last year, I would say even two years, with the rising prices in uh, the greater Toronto area, um, a lot of businesses have been outpriced and are looking for opportunities outside of GTA. Um, and that includes both commercial and industrial uh, users and developers. Um, we have seen over the last, uh, I would say, year, a lot of the greater Toronto brokers uh, listing a lot of sites uh, outside of GTA uh, and a lot of municipalities starting to look at uh, engaging brokers to help market the, their uh, business parks. Um, so I think, you know, the, the fact that uh, there's a lot more users uh, out there that are looking at, outside of uh, GTA is definitely a, a great opportunity and a great advantage for your park. Uh, the fact that a lot of um, residents are moving uh, to smaller communities because of the remote work uh, that's becoming a norm, I guess, right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something that definitely is going to uh, attract a lot more um, labor into the smaller communities. Um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, information out there in terms of uh, environmental sustainability. You know, a lot of companies are uh, have put forward goals uh, for their companies to ensure that, you know, they're, they're uh, environmentally friendly uh, and eco-friendly. Um, so we work uh, with a lot of these companies and uh, have been for the last couple of years. Um, the attractive development charges is another thing. Uh, right now in GTA, uh, some uh, municipalities are above $30 uh, per square foot. Uh, so $12 definitely looks like a very attractive number. Uh, there's quite a bit of provincial incentives available as well uh, for companies to move into smaller communities. Um, so I think, you know, the, the fact that you have the growing labor market, the, the fact that you have a lot of the smaller uh, users outpriced of GTA uh, puts a lot of advantage uh, in your hand. Yeah, uh, just, just for, for your worship and, and council's reference, uh, from Oshawa to Hamilton and everything in between and up sort of north just south of Barrie, uh, the, the total market size is about 800 million square feet of industrial product in, in the area I just described. That currently sits at 1.2% vacant, and that's yes. all asset classes, all sizes, whether it's 1,500 square feet of, of uh, industrial space, you know, right on up to a million square feet. So there's effectively zero vacancy. Rental rates over the last uh, four years have been going up on average between 18 and 22% per year. So, um, you know, imagine, you know, the, the shock of a, of a tenant rolling off of a five-year lease 
and you know, and effectively more than having to double um, their uh, their rental payments. I mean, I had a very difficult conversation yesterday with a tenant who said, you know, Adam, my my sales haven't doubled, uh, you know, in the last five years. How am I supposed to justify paying, you know, two and a half times my my rent? Uh, on the land side, which is you know obviously what we're here to talk about, pricing in uh, in that area that I described, I mean it varies depending on the locality, but you know uh, anywhere uh, from you know up to four million dollars per acre for for land in in Toronto proper, uh, out to well over a million dollars an acre in the in the sort of the far east or or far west, you know Oshawa Hamilton, and uh, just under a million dollars an acre in in Barrie. So the, the prices have gone up astronomically uh, because of demand um, you know this was happening before COVID COVID really accelerated a lot of this as it relates to e-commerce as it relates to, to pharma uh, as it relates to at-home de delivery things like that so th these are the kind of things that are really pushing um, both developers and and tenants uh, users um, further afoot uh, as it relates to um, as it relates to opportunities, you know, uh, outside of the uh, the large large sort of concentration market. Um, in terms of threats, just quickly on the last to wrap up this this page, um, you know, there's been supply chain issues all over the world. Every time you turn on the news, um, you hear about it. Um, what does that mean? Well, you know, the price of of, uh, of products for poor development for for developers, you know, whether it's steel, drywall, things like that, has gone up. Uh, there's timing uncertainty as it relates to uh, delivery, things like that. So um, that's something that we have to keep an eye on, and we actually track. Um, it's funny, five years ago when I was doing this, I, I didn't maybe knew the, the price of steel, but certainly didn't, you know, follow it. Um, with that going up, you know, anywhere from 20 to 25 percent per year, that, that obviously impacts you know developers and what they can pay for land. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, any delays in the, in the road or the, or the services that might be, uh, you know, uh, that we would be able to provide would obviously be a potential threat that we would want to keep a close eye on as it relates to the, the property specifically. So this slide just outlines a really, uh, you know, your location and its proximity to some of the, uh, major markets within Ontario. Um, uh, you know, you you guys are an hour, 20 minutes away from the greater Toronto area, uh, uh, which is nothing compared to, you know, traveling uh, through Toronto on in rush hour, because that can take three hours. Um, but yeah, just this slide outlines uh, where you guys are in proximity to uh, some of the logistics hubs, uh, the intermodal um uh, locations uh, and uh, of course the airport. So this uh, we initially started in uh, this presentation and trying to put a value on this property and uh, this slide represents commercial land sales uh, and availabilities in um, the smaller smaller rural areas of Ontario. And as you can see, the numbers are all over the place. You know, you see numbers in the fifty thousand uh, dollar per acre, all the way to five hundred thousand dollar an acre. Um, and that's kind of the reason why we thought going unpriced uh, on this project is uh, something that we feel strongly about. We have been very successful in Toronto uh, with a lot of these dispositions uh, and not putting a value on it or not putting a price on it. Um, and we're seeing that on the leasing side as well, uh, just because even developers are not, don't know what someone is willing to pay for space if they really need it. So um, this slide represents uh, all the availabilities in the market, uh, in the smaller markets uh, across Ontario, uh, and also all the sale comps for commercial land. Um, this uh, just shows the locations. Um, this slide represents industrial sales and availabilities uh, in the, those same markets. Um, and again, we are literally between you know eighty thousand to two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand an acre. Um, and th that you know just confirms that depending on the the demand, uh, you know the needs in the market. Uh, users and developers are willing to pay 
more uh, or less depending where it is so that just you know supports our uh, recommendation to move forward with a with listing this uh, land unpriced um, and trying to obtain the highest value possible in terms of um, potential outcome uh, or where we think the sale values will be uh, for commercial land anywhere from 150 to 200 thousand an acre depending uh, on the size of the parcel and then for industrial land we think we can get anywhere from 50 to 75 thousand dollars per acre again depending on what size uh, of a parcel these individuals will be buying you good there just to just take a quick pause because uh, we've really thrown a lot of information at you um your worship council does anyone have any questions uh so far um, or is there anything that we, we didn't cover um, that, that you wanted us to highlight at, at this point? Or, you know, should we keep going? Sensitive to everyone's time. Yep. Are there any questions? Martin? Yeah, thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, I have one question about, uh, it was on page, it was on page um, 11 of your report, guys. It was talking about uh adding applicable uses to our bylaws yeah we're going to be changing them but uh are you recommending that because that would uh, help target your potential buyers better like what additions do you what additions to the bylaw are you looking at to put in there because you're looking at a target base for whatever you're doing so is there anything extra that you can tell us right now that should be added so we, we definitely want to open this up a little bit more. Um, you do have, uh, you covered like the, the basic uh, industrial and commercial uses. We do want to open, especially on the commercial side uh, to, for, you know, restaurants and quick uh, service uh, food suppliers. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if we can do daycares or anything of that sort, but uh, definitely there's a lot of room for improvement and we can provide you with some additional details as to, you know, what specific uses we would want to see there. Um, on the industrial side, same thing, just being a little more specific in terms of what those uh, industrial uses that will be allowed will be. Um, I you know, with smaller communities, I've come across uh, a lot of rezoning or variance requirements on some of the projects that our team has been working on. Um, so we just want to make sure that we cover uh, as much of the, you know, detailed or more detailed uses in our zone or in your zoning bylaw. And we can provide some details as well. To Kathy's point, I think the, the ultimate goal, uh, Councilman, is, is just to avoid any potential um any potential buyer or tenant from from looking past this because what they're trying to do isn't specifically identified we're happy to share a broader list but uh, and again obviously you know minor variances are available to people it's just one extra step that we're trying to eliminate to sort of facilitate uh buyers and tenants coming to the area yeah and, and you know the the big thing will be not to slow down the process for development uh, so the more uses uh, that are outlined in the zoning bylaw, the easier it is to go through, you know, any processes for site plan approvals um, and ensuring that we have compliance, especially on the zoning part, uh, so that we don't have to uh, delay the process for, you know, getting the shovels in the ground. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, so may I have a follow up through the chair? If, if that's the case and you do have other examples or things you'd like to market um, with all your years of expertise what would you and you might not be able to answer this but what what would you see as the best uh, target to put in the industrial side I know you mentioned the commercial all different kinds of things but what would you see with all your years of expertise saying would be the best fit and best use of the land for Southgate, considering where we are and time and what have you, is that yeah, answer, no, is that possible to answer? Or I, I can absolutely give you a high level. Uh, yeah, uh, and then you know, again, we're happy to provide a, a, a specific list. I, I think what we've seen in the last 36 to sort of 60 months, you know, is obviously 
Um, you know, and, and my wife and I are a great example, right? We, we wanted everything delivered to our front door because we had a, a small baby before COVID. Uh, and that just that, that increased, you know, tenfold when we, um, you know, when we were locked in our in our homes. So I think what that's done is our, our expression is COVID really shone a light on things that that were working well um, for some businesses and things that were not working well. Um, and so my attitude is, um, you know, I always look and we would look to create a partnership with you. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what's best for your community because you represent your community and you live in your community. My personal opinion or my professional opinion is, uh, is that a distribution uh, is a clean use and is in very much demand as soon as you get outside of the uh, of the area I described, the, the broader GTHA. Um, because uh, again, you know, people in your community are no different than people in my neighborhood. Everyone wants uh, the ability to, um, if, if they so choose, have something delivered to their house. So I think we're seeing a rise in transportation costs in, in, in secondary communities. We're seeing a rise in distribution costs in secondary communities. And it doesn't matter if, if you're, you're online shopping for a, a shovel for the driveway this winter, uh, you know, or a bag of mulch, uh, you know, for the garden in the spring. So having the ability to have a, a large distribution center there for whether it's a third party logistics company, uh, and third, by third party logistics, meaning that they have contracts with different companies or having the, the company itself, maybe it's a, you know, a, a large example that everyone talks about is Amazon or, or any of the sort of the, the large e-com players, um, because what it does is it gives them access to population. And you know, what I like about that is that it's not a, it's not a heavy manufacturing use. Uh, it's not a dirty use you know, with any environmental risks. I mean, we, we work very heavily with our head of sustainability uh, for Canada. Um, you know, that, that's something that we're very sensitive to uh, as a company, but it's also something that, you know, we know you're very sensitive to. So I always sort of look for the, the optimal use, um, you know, with the least sort of uh, negative impact on, you know, on the community in terms of environment uh, or waste. So that, that would be my short answer. I apologize if I rambled on there. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, JLL has a lot of different corporate clients we work with, and uh, one of them is, for example, Canada Post. Our team has, you know, done a lot of uh, land acquisitions on their behalf. We have done a lot of leases on their behalf, um, and we did one in Innisville. Um, I, it was, I think they took possession in November of last year. Uh, it took us literally about eight months to find them a solution. Um, and those are, you know, these are kind of companies that have to service and have mandates across the country to be able to provide uh, shipping services. And, you know, letter mail is kind of a, a dying breed, if I can say that. But uh, parcel delivery is, you know, one of the biggest things uh, that we are engaged in on a daily basis. Uh, distribution facilities, uh, small users, uh, ma small manufacturing uh, companies that have been really outpriced uh, from GTA because I think you know that's that's our message is that there's so much demand from uh, GTA users to uh, find land outside of GTA that they can actually afford. Uh, and so I, uh, our team uh, did a deal with Backyard Discovery in Dundalk. Um, on Victoria Street, that these guys uh, took on 40,000 square feet for lease. Um, and the other big message that we want to send uh, in a, through this presentation is that we definitely recommend uh, working with a, a couple developers, both on the commercial and industrial side, to ensure that we can provide lease options in your community. Um, as I mentioned, our team does a lot of uh, leasing across Ontario, and you know, I have a requirement in Midland right now uh, for 40,000 square feet, but my client will only lease and there is no lease options in Midland. Uh, same with Peterborough, Brokeville. Like there's so much demand for lease options in, even in smaller communities and we can't fulfill them. So, you know, we, we would love to uh, market this property to developers and get these guys engaged and uh, get them to start building so that we can provide these options uh, to our clients. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, you did answer my question. Uh, e eventually, the final outcome won't be township and council's uh, decision, but I thank you for the, your professional opinion there, because uh, 
I was just wondering what you would see would be a best fit for what you guys do. And I can understand the idea of uh, logistically having a warehouse or that kind of thing put there. So again, thank you for your professional opinion. That's all. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Um, yes, Mayor Wigury, Barbara here. Okay, Barbara. And and remember, let's keep this at a, a very high level. We've got- uh, a, I'm a, trying. We've got a large <laughs> agenda uh, today, so um, we'll have to keep things moving along. So go ahead, Barbara. So it directly relates to this section, and uh, you had mentioned through you to Kathy, um, the you mentioned that through Oshawa to Hamilton, north to Barrie, you know, there's virtually zero vacancy. Do you not? And then you referred to the ability to work from home. Do you not anticipate that the um, organizations are embracing the ability of their employees to work from home, and that eventually, in the next, you know, two to five years, there's going to be a glut of commercial space in the GTA? Uh, uh, so, excellent question, and, and I'm happy to ask that, answer that. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, as a, a, an industrial lead, uh, my answer will be very different than if I were uh, in the room with my um, my commercial office uh, colleague, uh, who has a very different answer to that question. Um, the reality is this, for us in industrial, and, and a lot of people weren't aware of this, I uh, I would say that 95% of our plants uh, from, from last March, the start of the, the COVID outbreak, uh, we're in the office and more specifically we're in the warehouse and I'm, I'm sure you know like like myself and Kathy you saw a lot of the news reports you know in the surrounding areas about you know the the lack of labor and you know before the vaccines were rolled out you know getting people to, to come to work so uh, fortunately uh, for us and fortunately for this discussion um, when it comes to industrial and, and largely commercial uh, you need to have people in the in the buildings to, to make things go. Products, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not yet there with robots uh, moving products around and putting them on trucks. So the reality is for what we've described as, as potentially the, the, the best fit for that land, you need people in the, those buildings um, working them. Now, you know, the office side is obviously very different. And I, and I think that, you know, if we were proposing to do, you know, several office towers there, for example, or suburban office towers, um, you know, that, that would be, be very different. We're seeing some of our clients on the office side reducing headcount or allowing staff to, to work from home. Uh, I just read a report this morning, uh, you know, uh, when I got to the office about uh, PricewaterhouseCooper allowing 40,000 employees to work anywhere uh, across the USA as long as it was in the, you know, the confines of the border of the, of the U.S. So I think we'll start seeing more of that. Uh, as it relates to, to office workers, but I would argue that's probably a lot of tech companies, maybe some marketing companies, professional services companies. Um, unfortunately, what Kathy and I do requires an office and, and requires us going to see our clients uh, in their offices. And I can assure you that all of our clients on the industrial side are very much in their in their buildings and, and operating at, uh, at capacity. Okay, and and just and just one further um, that summary that you provided on page 11 that we that was being spoken to previously that's a list of uh, commercial or industrial options uh, that we've seen before and it would certainly uh, be there will be some of those options would be eliminated because of source water protection like dry cleaners or things like that um, I can I can appreciate I think what you are trying to say and if you could be brief on your I think it's more of a yes or no be as flexible as possible and inclusive as possible to attract as many potential um, leaseholds or purchasers of that land um, so that when we do rezone and we make that available we can market it to more than we're not we're not targeting just one. Uh, purchaser were you know were open to suggestions um, but in that rezoning quick question do you recommend that any of that 142 acres you referred to commercial and industrial but you didn't refer to residential so, should there be a blend of commercial industrial residential in that um, that highway 10 corridor I believe there's already quite a bit of 
projected and planned residential in in the town uh, mm -hmm. and we really concentrated on ensuring that we provide employment uh, to these residents and really looking at it from the mandate that we received uh, it was to uh, propose, uh, you know, and review this from an industrial commercial perspective and not residential because we are no residential experts at all. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. If uh, there's nothing further, we'll move on. Okay. So why don't we why don't we uh, just quickly review, you know, our our, our thoughts on the on the marketing strategy? Again, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've kind of had a few conversations about it. But I mean, our goal is to create a strategic partnership. Um, you know, myself personally, I sit on our industrial, our national industrial council. I'm also a member of, uh, which meets, you know, monthly. You know, and basically, I talk to my colleagues across the country. I'm also a member of our North American supply chain team. So basically, again, you know, I, we actually meet every two weeks, uh, talking about uh, all the key markets across North America. Why does that matter to to your worship and, and council? Well, basically, this is the kind of uh, development that would get touched throughout North America. So we would have clients, you know, literally from from all over North America, having access to the the possibility of this being a new home. Um, you know, the, the deal that Kathy referenced uh, that we did in Dundalk uh, was actually a phone call I got from one of my colleagues in Chicago saying, "Hey, we, we need to be right in the heart of Toronto uh, for this requirement." And you know, look where it ended up. It ended up, uh, you know, in your in your neighborhood for because of price because of availability um and because you know of our of our reach so i think that the, the key you know we, we do all of our in-house marketing uh we've got uh you know a technological advantage over some of our competitors i mean that's that's been tested over the last 20 months you know um you know all of our clients have been in the office some people couldn't get into the country we shot video um you know COVID has really uh forced us to pivot in, in terms of technology so we have the ability to market properties uh, literally globally um, now with the push of a button. Um, you know, we would still prefer that people could come up and see things in person, but if that's not available to uh, to people, we can we can certainly provide uh, solutions for that. So uh, this slide really represents uh, our connectivity within the market um, and who the target users and uh, developers would be. So, uh, you know, definitely going after uh, and filling the requirement on the commercial side. So going after commercial and, uh, and users and developers. We are finding that a lot of the, you know, the, the retailers, especially the, uh, the um, franchise chains, um, they don't want to own, they want to lease. Um, so, you know, having that uh, opportunity to lease space in your community, I think will be very beneficial. Uh, again, industrial users, developers, uh, having, you know, putting this on MLS, uh, broadcasting it through our eBlast to all the brokerages across Ontario um, and Toronto, uh, because there's a lot of uh, agents in our market that are running around for uh, with requirements in Ontario. Um, and that covers the brokerage side. So just our connectivity, our technology, and how we're going to market this uh, property to users, developers, and other brokers. Lastly, uh, so JLL is number 186 on the, uh, on the Fortune 500. We, we have an exclusive relationship uh, for representation of over 65% of companies on the Fortune 500. On the left, this is just a sample, a small sample of potential industrial clients. On the right, a uh, you know, uh, sample of commercial retail clients. We, we call this the success funnel. Uh, our job would be to connect uh, tenants and developers with this project so that it effectively you know, becomes 100% sold for, uh, for you. That's, that's our, our commitment to you, uh, you know, and, and this partnership. So um, again, any further questions on this, you can reach out to Kathy and I as it relates to, uh, to our specific clients. Hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from council? Okay, not seeing or hearing any. Um, we do have a motion moved by uh, Michael, seconded by Brian, that we received the presentation for uh, information. Uh, is anyone opposed to that? Okay, and that is carried. Uh, I'd like to thank you both. Lots of information uh, to go through here as well. 
and uh, thank you for your presentation. We're very informative. Thank you very much, Your Worship and, and Council. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have a motion moved by Martin, seconded by Barbara, for the adoption of the uh, minutes of um, September 15th meeting. Any discussion on that? Hearing none, anyone opposed? Okay, that's carried. Uh, next, we have um, moved by Jim, seconded by Michael, and that's the uh, Bell lease agreement. Uh, Derek, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, good morning. There's not really too much about that. We already have a current uh, lease agreement. Essentially, they just want to expand their compound seven feet to give us an extra thousand dollars a year so they can install uh, a cabinet. Okay. Any questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none. Anyone opposed? That is carried. And now we have the uh, bylaw uh, for that. Moved by Jason, seconded by Mark. Any discussion on this? Okay, Lindsay, if you'd do the vote, please. Thank you, uh, Mayor Woodbury. So, recorded vote called for bylaw 2021 147, the Bell Mobility Lease Agreement. Uh, Councillor Frew? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Uh, next is uh, item 8.2.1. Uh, moved by Barbara, seconded by Martin, and that's the uh, Sogging Mobility uh, uh, Appointment. Um, Yes, Lindsay, you probably don't want to add anything to this. Do you want me to? <laughs> yes, please. Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the uh, Jim was uh, looking for other committees, and this was one that uh, I had sat on that uh, uh, they meet regularly, uh, and a lot of it has been happening lately with uh, um, what's been going on with the uh, uh, reviews and things like that. But uh, I find that my schedule is jammed most of the time. So uh, I'd like to, to have Jim uh, take over for me and, and Brian's still the alternate. So if there's any questions or comments. Barbara? Barbara. So through you, and I can appreciate that Councillor Fru may be looking for more committees and that your time um, commitment is strained with everything that you are uh, participating in. Um, I mean, I would imagine our emergency declaration should be coming up for removal since the province has, but that's, that's another topic. But um, I'm concerned that at this late stage in the game, um, adding someone new to that committee that has um, no information from the county perspective. Um, if, if your time is tight and you're looking to release this um, committee, I think that our alternate who has experience at the committee and also can bring um, the perspective of the county would be a better fit. And um, uh, that would be uh, based on obviously Deputy Mayor Milne's availability, but um, I think at this late game, having a consistent uh, knowledge of that so that there's little um, familiar, the ability to familiarize on a quick basis. And um, if you're looking to step down from this committee, I would recommend that our alternate step up and assume that role. Okay. Um, the, uh, the county stuff, is uh is ongoing there's others on the committee that are also on county council uh for both gray and bruce um but the um uh 
most of the stuff is is already in order and already going. Um, I don't know. What does anyone else think? And silence is. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. I uh, I can I, I appreciate uh, Councillor Debreen's uh, vote of confidence there, uh, but uh, I, I I mean it's not it, it's not an overwhelming committee. I'll say that uh, there is a lot of information, no doubt no doubt about that uh, in, in my past experience on that committee. But um, I have full confidence that uh, Councillor Fru can can get himself up to speed. Um, the minutes from all of their meetings are readily available. Um, I, I uh, again, I, I appreciate the vote of confidence, Councillor Debreen, but I, I think uh, I think Councillor Fru can handle it quite well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none. Then um, is uh, anyone opposed to the motion? Opposed. Okay. Barbara's opposed. Anyone else opposed? And that is, oh, go ahead, Lindsay. I think we better just do a recorded vote because we have an opposition just so it's in the minutes. Okay. If you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So recorded vote for staff report CL 2021-025, the Smart Transit Board appointment for the remainder of the term. Uh, Councillor Shearson. Yes. Deputy Mayor. Yay. Councillor Fru. Am I able to vote? Yep. 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 Thanks. Your vote, Councillor Fru? Sure. Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? No. Councillor Shipston? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Vote of six to one, that's carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, 8.2.2, moved by Michael, seconded by Jason, and that's uh, appointing the pound keeper. Do you want to add anything to that, Lindsay? Um, I don't think so. It's in the report there. It's just so we have the uh, pound keeper available being the Katie Livestock uh, Market. Just if we have animals at large or anything like that, we haven't had an updated agreement since 2018. Uh, we did use them in 2019 once or twice, I believe, just on good faith of past relations. But I spoke to them earlier uh, this or just a couple weeks ago, actually, and they, they wanted an updated agreement as well. So just bringing this forward. Okay. Any questions or comments on this? Barbara. Just a quick question through you to Lindsay um, or whomever. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're pretty much the only game in town, right? For large animals yeah. on the road. Yeah. I believe that's what that I thought. Would List or Brussels be the next closest? I'm not sure. Yeah, but that's, that's even further. No, nope. yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I support your recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, uh, anyone opposed to the motion? And that is carried. And now we have the bylaw moved by Michael, and, or m moved by Martin, seconded by Michael. Uh, any comments on the bylaw? Okay, Lindsay, if you'd do the vote, please. Sure, thank you, Mayor Woodbury. Recorded vote for uh, bylaw 2021 140 to appoint the pound keeper. Uh, Councillor Shearson? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Frew? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, moved by Jim, seconded by Jason, is the uh, First Nations Land Acknowledgement Implementation Policy. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Lindsay? Um, 
I worked with uh, SON and the uh, Friendship Center on the wording. So I have that in the report there and in the policy that follows. Um, we decided to do just regular, regular council meetings is what we're proposing, I guess I should say. Uh, so it's consistent with the two meetings per month. Uh, the special meetings kind of come and go and they just pop up randomly. So we thought it would be better if we did it consistently at the regular meetings and then inaugural meeting as well. Um, but I think, I think that's about it. The report covers, covers the, the land acknowledgements in the report there to read. Okay, thanks Lindsay and thanks for your work on this. I think it's uh, an important step for us. Uh, any questions or comments? Nope, it's all good. Okay. I think I have a question, John. Question. Okay, go ahead, Brian. Um, I, guess, I guess I don't want to sound too grumpy, but <laughs> <laughs> given all that we've been through, in the past, I'm going to say eight to ten years, with uh, various groups in the community, to not see any reference in the land acknowledgement to Six Nations is rather disappointing. Um, we are rather unique here in Southgate, uh, in the southeast corner of Gray County, that we do have traditional territories from the Six Nations. The Haudenosaunee, uh, the traditional fire makers. Um, I would have thought uh, maybe there would have been some reference to Six Nations in this uh, land acknowledgement. And I truly believe that we need to include them. Uh, and, and also uh, the Métis. I mean, maybe not directly here in Southgate, but who knows? I mean, I don't. Uh, but I, I, I think there needs to be more inclusive reference to the First Nations uh, that, that are traditionally in this area. Uh, if we're going to do this, we better do it right. And I think to include more would be a better al alternative than to try to exclude some. So uh, again, I don't want to sound too grumpy, but if, if we can't amend this or, or do something better, I'd rather defer this for more consultation. But okay. I'll wait until I see if there's more comments, whether I will propose uh, to defer it or not. Okay, thank you. Lin Lindsay and then Dave. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, no, Deputy Mayor, I, I, I find it was really difficult to try to get the information. And that's where I checked with Son and the Friendship Center and I sent them a couple different versions and they said this one was the best. But I agree, I don't want it to, to not to leave people out, I want it to be inclusive. So if we need to defer, I, I'm totally okay with that. And we can go back to them and, and reword, but it, it's very difficult to try to figure out what all needs to be in there. And it's, uh, you don't get a lot of clear direction, but uh, I, I'm fine with deferring. I don't, like you said, I wanna get it right as well, so. Okay, Dave and then Barb. Yeah, and I don't want to be uh, argumentative in this, but does the county have a reference to uh, those, the Haudenosaunee and so on, like Brian yes. has referenced? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, um, okay, then I think we need to back up to, to go ahead to be in, in a better place because oftentimes some of these things are in relation to specifically where the meeting is located, but I think it is wise to, try and cover the bases of every square foot of the of Southgate uh, in this uh, statement. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I think we should de de defer it to Barb and then Martin. If there is a mover, if Brian is moving to defer, I would certainly second it. And that, uh, that happens. I agree that we need to get this right. And if we omit someone, we circulate our planning files to the Métis um, from time to time, we circulate. Certainly, um, we're on the grant, and uh, I think that we could look to the county's land acknowledgement as well as a good example of of, of inclusivity. Uh, so, uh, if Brian is moving to defer, I would second that. 
before okay. before we go there if, if we don't mind could, is can we discuss the it, like saying when we say it if is everyone agreeable for regular meetings because i i'll make changes to that as well if not Okay. That's a good point. Okay. Discuss right. the policy, what we actually say can come back for approval. Okay. Martin? Uh, well, uh, through the chair, Lindsay, I'm fine with those dates, the reg regular council meetings. And if there is anything special going on, that's usually something from count, uh, county anyway, or, or, you know, something like uh, Remembrance Day, things like that. So I like the idea of just at the council. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to go along with uh, what Brian said. I'm going to show my ignorance. And I thought uh, the east side of the township was uh, in this. So I think, again, we should uh, make sure everybody's in there. So, yep. OK with the timing of the council meetings and defer this to get the other people that aren't in put in. So I'm glad Brian mentioned that. Thank you. Okay, so Brian, are you uh, willing to move to defer? I am. Okay. But I, I, I saw yep. Jason had a comment there too. Maybe you couldn't see him. No, I can't. I can't see him or or you. Go ahead, uh, Jason. Um, I guess I'll be the bad guy here. I I'm just not sure whether we have to do this at every council meeting. Um, I know that's going to sound bad. I I support the, these groups. I'm not saying I don't. We're talking about inclusivity, inclusivity, and we're only acknowledging one group every council meeting. We talk about Remembrance Day. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I just I don't think it has to be every council meeting. It, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things, and to be inclusive, I think it should be maybe just special meetings. But that's my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Um. So we, we have a motion to defer, and that is moved by Brian and seconded by <clears throat> Barbara. Um, has anyone uh, got any more discussion on that? Just just to be clear, John. Yep. Just to be clear, I, I want to defer it so that we can rework the wording of the of the land acknowledgement. I'm I'm quite happy uh, to uh, have the acknowledgement read at just council meetings and just special meetings, like the inaugural. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, and and I do appreciate the work that Lindsay put into this, and it's not easy. I get it. I un I understand that <clears throat> because uh, it it is uh, you know the 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 fact of the acknowledgement is far more important than the actual wording of the acknowledgement, and and I understand that. And <clears throat> excuse me, Lindsay and I talked about that. Um, so. Uh, I, I appreciate the work that's gone into this, but I think we we can do a little better if we if we back up and and rework it a bit. So, yes, I will I will move that we defer it um, to uh, for for further consultation okay. and bring it back to uh, a, a, another council meeting as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, any comments on on the deferral? Jason has his hand up. Okay, go ahead, Jason. Uh, not on the deferral. I just, uh, as again, I said, playing the bad guy. At one time, did we do the Lord's Prayer and stuff before council meetings? Am I wrong on that years ago? Dave's nodding his head, so, yeah. Uh, that, and Brian, maybe correct me on this, but I think that was uh, pre-amalgamation. There might have been a bit post-amalgamation, but uh, uh, don't disagree with you. That uh, fell off the rails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm just like I'm. I'm not against this. I just it, it's just there's a lot of other stuff that we just forget about, and I don't know. It's just I don't think it has to be every week, and I just worry we're just. I understand it's a touchy topic, but it's uh, you know to be inclusive, and then we're just going to say this at every meeting about this one group doesn't sit right with me. But that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jason, and. Uh, Something that the county does that we we don't do either is O Canada, and I think that may be <clears throat> an important thing. Um, any other comments? Okay. Anyone opposed to the deferral? And that is carried then. <clears throat>
So, Lindsay, is the uh, bylaw automatically deferred then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, we will go to, uh, we'll just finish up with Lindsay's reports and then take a break in case anyone's uh, thinking they need to get up and stretch. Uh, next one is 8.2.6, and that's an uh, amendment to the flag policy moved by Jim and seconded by uh, Barbara. Uh, Lindsay, anything on that? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's in the report there. It's just a, a simple amendment to add the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation to lower the flags. And then we just amended the policy. Nothing else changed in the policy. Okay. Any questions or comments on this? Hearing none. Uh, is anyone uh, opposed? That is carried. Uh, and then now we have the bylaw moved by Jason and seconded by Michael. Anyone, any comments on the bylaw? Okay, hearing none. Lindsay, I'll get you to do the vote. Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. So recorded vote for bylaw 2021-146 to adopt the displaying flags policy. Uh, Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Councillor Frew? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Councillor Sipston? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks for your reports, Lindsay. Um, we'll take a, a recess now. Uh, is quarter two sufficient? It gives us nine minutes. Okay, so we'll come back for a quarter two. Thanks, everyone.
Okay, I've got uh, 1045 and we got, it looks like most of council back. I think we're only missing Michael. So we'll give him a minute and the others to jump back on. <clears throat> I'm here. Oh, you're there. Okay. Um, so we'll call the meeting back to order. And uh, Dave's, uh, your policies are up next, or your uh, reports, I mean. Uh, first one is uh, moved by Brian, seconded by Jim, and it's the uh, vaccination policy. So uh, Dave, if you wanted to talk about that. Okay, so I, I think uh, we have uh, put, made it pretty clear in the report uh, what has changed from the last uh, go around. Um, and we've done an addendum report uh, and issued it Monday to make a change in relation to new hires. And at this point, I think uh, I'll just uh, entertain questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for all the work. Uh that you and, and other staff members have been putting into this. Um, any questions or comments? Brian. Thanks, John. And I guess I'm gonna preface this by saying I still have concerns around the notion that council is gonna review any decision based on this policy. Under the Ontario Municipal Act, and my copy that I've got is 2004, and that's not the most current one, but I'm sure the numbers might change a little bit, but the wording probably hasn't. The role of council is to develop and evaluate policies and to ensure that administration practices and procedures are in place. The role of administration is to implement council's decisions and establish practices and procedures to carry out council's decision. I have no concerns with the vaccination policy in the goals that we're trying to get to, to protect our staff and all the rest of it. I, I have no concerns with that. But for example, it is the role of council to put in place a policy to install a pride crosswalk in a certain place within a certain budget. And it is the role of administration to establish procedures to comply with that decision to install said crosswalk. If we're gonna put in place a policy to deal with people that either will not disclose their vaccination status or will not be vaccinated, then we need to do that. And, and I think we should. But if we're gonna allow council to review, review the decisions from that, deci or them, from that policy, is council gonna overturn that decision? And if they are, what's the point of the policy? Either the policy tells you what to do or it doesn't. So in my mind, allowing council to review the decisions from those policies is wrong. You can't do that. And I've talked with some senior administrations and other municipalities and they all agree, no, that is not the role of council. Council is to put the policy in place. Administration is to carry out the policy. Should council be informed of what the decision is? Absolutely. But they're not to be asked to review the policy because that is the role of administration. So I'm gonna listen to other comments, but ultimately I'm gonna ask for an amendment to review all reference to council uh, review. So those are my comments, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, thanks, Dave, and then Martin. But maybe let's let Martin go and I'll respond to uh, his and Brian's comments. Okay, Martin. Well, thank you uh, through the through the chair to everyone. Uh, that was one of the things that uh, I kind of looked at 
when I really read this thing through, uh, what Brian just said, I'm not as well versed in procedure as probably uh, Brian is, but it, that did stick out. Um, talking with Dave last week, uh, I find this policy is one of the hardest ones we've ever looked at, and it is quite moderate compared to something, some other places that Dave said that they're too harsh and some aren't doing enough. So this is a very good, it's quite moderate. Um, when it's based on the occupational health and safety, I did a lot, this is just a comment, there is a question to follow. I did a lot of looking at both the Canadian American and Ontario, and there's a lot of history there. Uh, the American, uh, through the Department of Labor down there, came to an actual act in the 70s. Manitoba was the first uh, province in 71, and then Ontario, and then Canada in 79. And my comment is this, some, sometimes we are getting over policy because everything I read in those acts is basically in this policy, which is new. Um, and in the last couple of years, every act has updated emergency policies that that are directing us what to do. My point is, these all these things have been around because the labor the labor act, uh, occupational health and safety, as I said for 50 years, has talked about communicable diseases, anything that will hurt. Uh, an employee. So my 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 idea is like, do we really need this? Obviously we do, but uh, when it comes down to it, I did ask Dave a question about our workplace, the the community of people that make up our workforce, and I'm I think through the chair if I could ask Kayla the same question because it has been a few more days now. Uh, if Kayla's there, if she could just answer a simple question, how, how many people in our workforce, less committee members and council members, how many are not vaccinated? Or Dave, you can answer that again. Um, I'm not okay, sure but... I want to say. Um... Point of order. Yeah, Barb. If, if if Kayla has been mandated with through this policy to keep the status of, I, I I'm not I'm I'm not comfortable knowing the the sheer numbers of people who are or are not vaccinated. I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that that's an appropriate question. But uh, I defer. Clerk's got her hand up. Go ahead, uh, Lindsay. Yeah, that that's private. She, she can't disclose that. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I wasn't asking for any names uh, because if, put it this way, if most of the workforce is vaccinated, therefore we have herd, herd mentality or that threshold. So that could affect this policy. That's all I meant. So anyway, okay. I'll let yep. somebody else talk. Okay. Dave and then Barb. So um, those last comments were were uh, concerning. I mean, we definitely need a policy. There's a very high percentage of uh, municipalities having a policy like this. Um, and uh, you know, I, if you go to the human rights rights statement that they made, uh, the human, Ontario Human Rights Code uh, put in place on 22nd of uh, of uh, September a statement on policy uh, related to COVID-19 vaccinations and proof of vaccine certificates. And one of their last statements in here is personal preferences and singular beliefs are not protected. And that's relation in relation to accommodation. And that statement alone really says that we're not protecting just an employee. We're protecting all the employees. And it's not just about Southgate's protection, but we're doing our part in the community as staff, as council members, as committee members, as volunteers um, to participate in this vaccination policy and comply with it uh, as much as possible and uh, protect our community. It's not about the one, it's about the, the 
the community as a whole. And I think uh, our uh, practices in Southgate as a whole is reflected in the numbers that, that we are following guidance from the health unit and the province in, in uh, masking and washing hands and getting vaccinated. So um, I think it's really uh, critical that we do have a vaccination policy. I, I would reflect back that I don't think we want to follow any lead on from the United States because uh, they're in greater turmoil than than we are. Uh, but uh, then I'll, I think I kind of responded to, to that question. Well, there was one part, uh, how many, and, and yes, we cannot say that, but I will tell you that it's a very high percentage of our employees that um, have been vaccinated and uh, it's, it's comparable, if not uh, better than averages. Um, and I would say uh, that's even more reason why we need to have a vaccination policy to protect that, those, those people. Um, sorry. Uh, back to Brian's question, I go to the policy. We're not asking council and, and I agree with you about, you know, once we make the policy, the policy is the policy. But um, I think uh, if you look under uh, the accommodation request process, the township commits to working with the employee to provide accommodation until undue hardship. Only in extreme circumstances will the township pr proceed with layoff or termination actions and will have this decision reviewed by council. So it's an individual decision that we're talking about. And I see head shaking, but I always think about, uh, I think we're better to caution and communicate. And that's what that is, communicate, not change policy, but caution and communicate and have more involvement in those discussions because they're very, um, they're very severe if we're to lay somebody off or terminate. And I think that communication provides uh, you know, a better staff relationship um, and doesn't allow, um, uh, anyway, I guess that what I'm saying is, I think my tenure has been this long and, and I've survived the ups and downs because of communication and keeping council informed. Again, I, this is not about policy review. Um, and I, I just think good communications and, and that type of culture for the future will help other people uh, you know have those discussions uh, when they think it's appropriate with council like even today and I I'm not I'm not uh, pushing back on that but there was the councillor mentioned about knowing about uh, uh, some of these claims and maybe we need to to do a better job at that but uh, um, I just think communication is really, really important and that we don't want uh, administration heading off um, when they think they're right, when they maybe aren't and should uh, have a final review and, and uh, look at it from council because ultimately you are responsible um, over and above staff decisions. I'll leave it with you. Thanks, Dave. Barbara. Thank you, Mayor Woodbury and through you, Try as I might, I can't, I have this written down and I can't find which document or if it's in multiple documents. Um, and it's probably explained somewhere in a definition. But at some point, there's a, there's a reference that unvaccinated employees shall follow a daily protocol of doing the self-screening. And it says, with regard to employees who believe they may have COVID symptoms and the, and my ink started to run out, and the requirement they cannot come into work, they must notify their supervisor that they cannot come into work and to immediately get tested, please. Con so my question is, is can you confirm that this reference is all employees, regardless of vaccination status, should be doing a daily COVID screening? because vaccinated employees can get COVID. So Kayla's got her hand up. Yep. I think she knows okay. where I'm going with this. Yeah, Kayla and then Dave, if you want to add. Go ahead, Kayla. Dave, you're on mute. I'm gonna go first and I'm gonna correct okay. something. 
they there was a reference that that I was yes I was behind this policy and pushing it but Kayla did a high 90 percent of the lifting on this thing and many of us were involved with it as advisors so Kayla's best prepared to answer this question go ahead Kayla the mayor was going to let her answer it <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> So yes, I that is most likely without me flipping through all the pages in the rapid antigen testing protocol. And the reason it says unvaccinated is because that protocol is specifically for unvaccinated individuals. Our screening protocol, which is an internal SOP that we have, does we do get everybody to screen every day and they must sign off every day that they have completed the screening and that they passed. Perfect. So it's a standard operating procedure that we don't have because that's an internal operational thing. Um, but that's great. That's all I really wanted to know is that all employees are doing the daily screening and they have certain criteria that if they have symptoms out of the ordinary, you know, and certainly multiple symptoms, um, they've got a, a procedure to follow. So thank you very much for clarifying that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Brian. Well, I'm gonna take another run at it because I'm not satisfied yet. I think it was Dave that said that we have a uh, responsibility to all of our staff ultimately. And I would push back and say on a moral level, yes, but technically no. Council has one employee, and again, I refer to the Municipal Act. We have one employee, that is the CAO. By asking council in this proposed policy to review decisions related to this policy, you're asking council to review a decision regarding an employee that you are not responsible for. If this was Dave, or the, I'll say the CAO, if this was the CAO, yes, we have the decision to either, whatever it is, we manage Dave's employment contract. We do not supervise any other employee directly. So to ask council to review a decision, and Dave says if councils or if the CAO or administration's going off in the wrong direction, that's their decision and council will bear that. But to have council overturn that decision undermines the administration drastically. And you, I don't think we wanna go there. That's not right, that's not our role. And if you're gonna do it on this policy, you're asking to review every decision that management makes or could be. So. To bring it to a head, I will ask for an amendment. I'm gonna move an amendment to review all reference to council review of policy decisions. Okay, is there a seconder? Martin will second that, okay. Discussion on the amendment. Barbara. I am supportive of what Brian has so eloquently communicated. Would I think removing that, I think any, where it, where it refers to only in extreme circumstances will the township proceed with layoff or termination. And that is, I, I just wanna make sure that the decision of the supervisor, it's not the decision of the supervisor, or is it the decision of the super, supervisor in consultation with the HR coordinator? Like they're, like that, I, I agree with Brian that, um, you know, we want to be informed, but we're but not to the point of overriding the decision. But I also want to make sure that there's a robust review of that decision by the HR coordinator, whatever measures that need to be taken into consideration, because it is supposed to be of an extreme case, um, uh, an example of maybe an employee just totally disregards all the protocols and refuses to 
you know, follow the policy. Um, you know, that's a decision that needs to be in consultation with the HR coordinator. Um, is So Kayla had her hand up. Thank you. Yep. Just waiting for you to finish. Yep, go ahead, Kayla. Okay, thank you. So this this would only be the HR coordinator and senior management making these decisions because the supervisor actually doesn't even know. Right, so it, it really you. is, it would be in heavily in consultation with myself, the department manager and the CAO. And by supervisor, I meant the department head, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but it would Thank be you. also myself and the CAO because if it's that level, we need to involve Dave as well. And the and through so follow up. So involving the CAO, whomever that is at the time. Um, hopefully, this never happens. It would only involve department heads and the CAO should there be this um, breach of policy because everything is held in confidence with you, Kayla, the HR coordinator. Okay. Yes. Um, Thank you. So let me just clarify that or the accommodation process because I am not specifically qualified to know if somebody can perform their duties with the accommodation that they're requesting. Certainly. So I would need to work with just that specific department manager, not all department heads. Okay. Thank you so much. With... Okay. Any other questions, Dave? Oh, and then Jim. So. Uh... There was a comment used the word hope. We can't set policy based on hope. Um, we have to base it on the reality of what the decision may be that is required. Um, I think one of the reasons for putting this in here, and I'm going to kind of throw out a drastic situation, is let's say the present CEO or the future CEO is, doesn't participate in this and and uh, is not vaccinated. Where does that leave? Uh, uh, Kayla and the senior management team making that decision. Uh, and that's where I think uh, council should have uh, some awareness of it happening uh, of, of the situation and should have obviously some awareness of making the decision at some level if it's at that level of management. But um, anyway, I just go back to this is just about good communications and uh, making sure that we're all on the same page before it happens. That's what that's about. Um, and the policy, not every policy sure has this type of a line in it, but I think the the severity of this policy outcomes, um, I think, uh, anyway, the, the reason for putting it in is just that uh, more people are involved before the decision is made. And uh, it, for, for three staff to deal with it, if that's what council wants, that's what we will do. But if we follow this policy and we cannot accommodate, we will have to possibly lay somebody off and terminate. But I mean, we can't hope for these things. They may be reality. That's all I'm saying. And then it gets back into, you know, I think more people being involved in those conversations because who knows until this, some of this stuff is tested in court, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, like the legal areas are, are commenting that we're on in safe places. Human rights uh, code policy statements now support it, but uh, you, you don't know. And, and uh, so it could get uh, into the courts to solve some of these things if it really goes that far, but uh, hopefully not. Okay, Jim and then Barb. We've already established that this is a very serious health matter. Dave, why don't you take this report, submit it to the Health and Safety Committee, let them read it, and let them bring a recommendation forward? Because Council can't ignore a recommendation from the Health and Safety Committee. It takes you out of the picture. Um, I would, I'll would. i let Kayla comment on that because she was uh, heavily involved with discussions with Health and Safety, but I would say the Health and Safety Committee supported a vaccination policy and 
and the thing, the outcomes from that. But maybe Kayla, you can comment better there. Okay, go ahead, Bill. So we did discuss the policy in the Health and Safety Committee, and all this policy has been sent out to um, all employees, including the Health and Safety Committee. I, I mean, it, it's not specifically coming from them, but it's with consultation from them. I guess is a better way to put it. The Health and Safety Committee has the authority to submit the report as a recommendation. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Barb. Thank you, um, Mayor Woodbury. I think I want to clarify to Dave that I absolutely agree. You can't have hope for that a policy will work. I'm so the terminology I used was that hopefully we'll never get to that clause where we're having to terminate someone. We're, I mean, we can, you know, always hope, but we have the policy to guide us. Um, I absolutely agree that through the HR coordinator and senior management, they make that decision in consultation as in those extreme circumstances. And while Council shouldn't be involved in that decision making process because we've provided the policy to guide staff that there is nothing that prohibit or that prevents the CAO who uh, to communicate and inform council in closed session of decisions that have been made and the reasons why. And which the CAO has been very good about keeping council informed um, on you know various matters that are his or department heads decisions um, so that we know that you know we could end up in court we could end up um, this is happening in case you know so that we're informed but not to make the decision to overturn that decision so i i, I trust that the cio will continue to keep Council informed if he feels it is necessary, but not to overturn the decision. Okay, Dave. Yeah, and I guess I guess that's really the 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 fiber of this discussion is is I think that this we're saying decision reviewed. So I mean, just communications. If we want to put different word in there and pass it with that, have a discussion or something, but maybe we'll get to a place where we'll say well we need to put this person on the sidelines because there's no way to accommodate and i applaud kayla for again for her hard work on those three accommodation forms that uh, she's created really does a great job at, at uh, providing those opportunities for accommodation and if we can't accommodate you know this policy is saying put them on the sidelines without pay maybe we would get advice from council that you know it's one person they're a valuable person to the organization but to protect the employees maybe we would put them on the sidelines with pay instead um or or something to that whatever but that's a discussion we can have or if council wants us to follow the policy and, and pull that out that's fine with us but uh, we will still be communicating with you on these uh, issues Okay. Follow up. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. And then if the policy get... says that they're put on leave without pay, and now you're making an exception for an employee over another employee who, what you're telling them is that you're not valued enough. So either we put them on leave with pay, the policy says they will go on leave with pay or without pay. Um, I agree, Dave, that, you know, if you want to change the words and council will be informed um, of the decision, that changes the context of the word review, because review implies that we have input into the decision. Um, I, think, I think you cannot show any means of favoritism. Um, the choice is theirs to not get vaccinated and and i and i respect that choice um being put on leave without pay 
and you know to to what to you know either get vaccinated or don't come back or then you're terminated then you're forcing someone to go against their beliefs i like i i have an issue with that the the, the decision before us the the resolution or the amendment before us is whether or not council will have review of the decision and i would suggest that we don't but that we be kept informed of the decision because it it affects a lot of other avenues if we can deal with that amendment we can have further discussion about you know other scenarios but i think um i'll leave that to to brian we have a mover and seconder for removing or changing the, the the wording to have the decision or have the decision have council informed of the decision as opposed to have the decision reviewed. Okay, so the motion we the amendment we have is to remove that the wording. Um, Lindsay, if you want to just kind of go over, I can sh I, I can share around it. Screen. I'll share my screen with what I have right now from from Brian's amendment. Okay. That would be good. Thank you. Give me a sec. I have highlighted what I've added, but okay. that's if you want to remove completely. Okay. Well, yeah, that was Brian's uh, motion. There's an amendment, so I believe. Stand right now because that that amendment is on the table. Yeah. Okay, and that's that's what your intent was, Brian. Um, just there's one word missing, and it's uh, amended to remove all reference to council's review of the vaccination policy decisions. Okay. Because it's very much council's purview to review the policy before it's put in place, but once it's in place. The decisions coming out of that policy are not council's purview. That is the purview of administration. And that's the gist of my thing. And by golly, council better, and absolutely, staff have a great track record of keeping council informed for the most part. And by golly, that better can continue on. And it, and it will. I'm, I'm confident of that. So that's just the, that, that is very much the gist of my uh, amendment here. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Okay, so that's the amendment before us. Any other discussion on this amendment? Okay, is anyone, oh, Dave? Yeah, uh, sorry, I just can't, I can't hold back. Um, let me be clear that any discussions with council about uh, a, a variance in this policy. So, I mean, the policy is a policy and we'll follow that. But we may come to a point where staff in discussions eight with hr the department head just don't feel it's right we've got one employee that we can't accommodate and we may come to council and say you know the policy is this but we recommend that in this situation and we wouldn't be doing it if we do it for one we did do it for all but i'm saying if there was one situation we might come to you and say hey this is our recommendation of uh you know some some extenuating circumstances that we would uh um, not amend the policy, but have a have a further consideration of accommodation in some fashion, and and that's I think the point to um, this whole this whole discussion. But I mean, good communications makes good uh, relationships, and that's all I'm getting at. And I respect what Brian has said at the end there that we will continue to communicate with you, maybe no matter what you tell us, because I think that's just good relationship and good um good operations of an organization yep okay michael i believe a policy is a policy and if we have it wrote down in a certain way and some individual is not following it that no matter what circumstances this person has we cannot give him lenience over someone else that's just that's just a two-way street for as far as i'm concerned so it's either one way or the other way you can't have both you can't be coming to us and saying well you know the policy says this but we want to do that i don't think that's fair to anybody because i mean if i was a backbencher i'd just sit and wait and see what happens to me i wouldn't do anything 
Okay, thank you. Um, Barb, I saw your hand up, but um, unless it's something really pressing, you've had way more than the two two questions per, per thing. So we've been on this over a half hour. Absolutely. Disregard my hand then, thank you. Okay. Um, so not seeing any else's hand up, is there anyone opposed to this amendment? Okay, see none, so that's carried. So now we're back to the original motion as amended. Any further comment on that? Okay, seeing none, oh, Martin. Yeah, sorry, uh, through the chair to Dave, uh, just to, with the antigen test kit costs, uh, when I looked at the uh, Occupational Health and Safety, I, I certainly did not just look at the American one. I looked at the Canadian one too. And it, it did seem to infer the obligation was leaning more to the employer than the employee. So um, is there any way that you can supply these kits to them anyway because it's an obligation and if there is a lack in supply then they have to buy their own in the interim period before you get the township gets more is that a way of doing this because all right now it's on the onus of the employer employee uh so, and i can see that but so we we have applied for to get antigen t test kits and as long as we can get them for free through health uh, through the health department or the health unit, uh, we will do that. But when they run out, uh, this policy would be required that uh, unvaccinated would uh, be required to do their testing at their cost from then on. Okay. Well, you know, that, that's fair. There's an obligation both ways. I, I can see that. If, if an employee, I know this isn't part, but just a question, uh, and if, if an employee does spend a certain amount of money on a rapid test kit, I hope that he would he would keep the receipts. Would there be something the township would give them as a double, uh, you know, just confirmation that they did spend this money on that just to help them out? Because it seems right now everywhere we're looking, we need two forms of ID. So why not two forms of uh, confirmation? Would the township be willing to do that for them so it would enhance their claim on their taxes? medical claim on their taxes? Because I'm sure this would be able to be written off because you're keeping healthy yeah. to uh, keep gainfully employed. So would that be yeah, something I, that could I'm be not, looked at? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure of the CRA rules in relation to that, but uh, I Good would point. suggest that they purchase it. If they go to the drugstore, they'll purchase it. They could keep the receipts and, and be in consultation with their accountant on that type of thing. I'm not sure okay. that's what, anything we would do to put it on their uh, T4 or anything like that, that would be on their their own personal. Oh no, I didn't mean a T4. I didn't mean a receipt. I just meant a, a letter saying this employee did <coughs> so much and did have this test so many times. It was, it'd just be a letter to confirm their receipt. That's all. Yeah, that. I mean, that's, if we got, that's an aside. If we, yeah, if we got requested that, that would be easy enough that uh, we could say between these dates and this date we received. Uh, you know, 25 antigen test reports from this employee. Uh, we could do that. Okay. Well, I'm just, I, I just thought of that reading it right now. Because uh, if they are going to be on, well, not on the hook, but if they do have to pay out of their own pocket, they should at least try to get some recompense, recompense somewhere. So that's good to know, yep. Dave. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any more questions or comments on uh, as amended? Okay. Seeing none, anyone opposed to the motion? Okay, and that is carried. Uh, next up, moved by Jason, seconded by uh, Michael, the bylaw for that. Any discussion on the bylaw? Seeing none, Lindsay, I'll uh, get you to do the, motion, or the vote, please. Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. So recorded vote for bylaw 2021-148, which is the COVID-19 vaccination policy as amended. Uh, Councillor Shipston. 
Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Frew? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Thank you. Next, moved by Martin, seconded by Michael, and that's the purchase and sale agreement uh, amendment at, for the Eco Park Casa Terra Corporation. Dave? So, uh, I maybe have the two most controversial reports today, and I, I, I'll make the initial comments of don't shoot the messenger. This was a request by Casa Terra. They've been working uh, with us as well and likely um, more harder on their uh, project for a housing development uh, um, in uh, their property out at 61 and 22. It is um, focusing towards affordable and attainable housing, we believe. And uh, they have been lacking on, on effort towards site planning, although they're working on that at the same time uh, of their project for the tech Casa Terra, which is prefab uh, construction of wall panels, floor panels, and and uh, so on for cabins and this type of uh, uh, housing development uh, that they're working on. So they have what they've done is they've uh, provided another ten thousand dollars in uh, security and want to just extend uh, till December fifteenth of twenty twenty one the closing so they can do more. Uh, site planning work with uh, with our planner and staff. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments, Brian and Barbara? And in council, in 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 saying Dave has the two most controversial. I don't think I've had a meeting where I've said so much in the past. But anyway, um, purchase sure, yeah. and sale agreements uh, in uh, section one under general. 1A, the uh, script of the uh, uh, bank draft does not match the numbers. The script says 12,250, whereas the digits say 22,250. That needs to be fixed. And I can appreciate the uh, sentiment in the report that says that it has been communicated that no further extensions will be entertained. And yet, in the actual purchase and sale agreement, they are afforded the opportunity to ask for more extensions. Uh, I'm not just sure, well, I'm, I'm fairly sure which one would hold up if you were pushed, the report or the actual purchase and sale agreement. So I'm looking for a little more assurance in the purchase and sale agreement that we're done with extensions, except for, of course, if there's legal or something of that nature that needs to be uh, the date needs to be pushed out. So I'm looking for a little more assurance there, Dave, please. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that question. We'll make that correction uh, in the agreement with the 22,000 by, by the addition of that. And, uh, I think the one thing that we have pushed back and uh, they didn't uh, realize that, uh, uh, that they had the greater latitude of two years in, uh, so in Schedule C, one uh, A, we have changed that from two years to start uh, to get their zoning and start building to um, one year. And we've changed uh, from three years to two years for having the building substantially completed. So I think, you know, the change in, in a few months, we're putting more pressure on it to get this project done a year later or a year, a year earlier. So, um, they have been good to work with. Uh, I know their focus is to get on with both projects, but uh, they put a lot of effort into uh, the other project, which I am sympathetic towards because this housing development is, is really important to uh, the Attainable and Affordable Housing Committee. Um, so there's a lot of synergies between these two projects and, and working with them, I think, uh, uh, and putting more pressure to do it sooner in Schedule C is is a is an important gain in this uh, in this document because we made that change after this uh, was done in February and now we uh, we're pushing a little harder uh, with this new agreement like we did the later ones. Okay, 
Thank you. Okay, thanks, Barbara. So through you, I did mention this to uh, Dave earlier, but I, I still have concerns that this purchase in this manufacturing facility, because the CAO keeps referring to a housing development that has neither got an application in nor a public process, uh, that um, you know that it that this manufacturing facility is relying on the approval of a rezoning of a property to a housing development for affordable or attainable whatever. Um, and uh, that hasn't even, you know, that, that should have nothing to do with whether or not this uh, purchaser uh, buys this land and creates his manufacturing facility. I feel it's almost as if we're tying, you know, we're gonna sell you this property because you're gonna use it to, to create housing, um, you know, on a property that hasn't even gone through a public process. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, let me be very, very clear that the, the, the success of Casaterra business is no way going to rely on the development at 22 and 61 on the old Mythwood property uh, being a successful business. They, they are two standalone businesses uh, sure, if that uh, was, uh, had gone forward or does go forward, it would be, you know, that they would hope to uh, construct uh, some of their materials on that property, but that's a small project in comparison to the output of the Casa Terra um, uh, project itself. Um, as far as the project on 22 and 61, they are in the planning process, Saugeen Valley, um, and staff, Southgate staff have walked the property with the consultants and uh, and the owner, and uh, it's well on its way going through that due diligence process uh, with the planning people. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted it verbalized that one has nothing to do with the other, and that a full and wholesome process will be followed. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, was anyone opposed to the motion? That is carried. And now we have the uh, bylaw for that, moved by Barbara, seconded by Jim. Any discussion on the bylaw? Okay, Lindsay. Thank you, uh, Mayor Woodbury. Recorded vote for bylaw 2021-149, purchase and sale agreement with Casa Terra Corporation. Uh, Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Point. Councillor Green. Mayor Wood, is that as amended? This is the, the, it's just the, the money, it was just a, <clears throat> a friendly amendment. Like we're not yeah. taking out anything else as far as I understand. Okay, thank you. In yeah. favor. Uh, Councillor Dobreen. In favor. Councillor Rice. Yes. Councillor Shearson. Yes. See Mayor Mill? Yay. Councillor Frew? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Councillor Shipston? I think you're muted. Yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Kayla, we're moving on to uh, your report. Go ahead, Lindsay. Can we just do a, a motion to go past noon before we start, Caleb, please? Sure. Barb Thank will you. move it and Martin will second it. Any discussion? Seeing none, anyone opposed? That is carried. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, so, Caleb, we've got a couple of your reports and uh, I should tell everyone else what I was telling you the other day. Thanks for all the work you've been doing on, on a lot of these things. Um, I was looking at uh, one of the uh, emails uh, that Kayla sent out uh, oh, a few weeks ago, and I don't know whether it was my mind and me kind of hitting it a little bit at a time or whether uh, it spaced out funny on my uh, on my phone, but uh, it made me chuckle because it's it's true. It said Kayla, best HR consultant or uh, coordinator. So. With the work you've done here, yes, you're the you 
the best uh, HR coordinator. So thank you. Um, we have this motion moved by Jason, seconded by Martin, and uh, that's the operator, laborer, and cemetery posting. If you'd like to add anything about that? I think the report is fairly self-explanatory. We have this opening because of movement within and it was being filled by a contract, but now we're ready to do it as a full-time position. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, anyone opposed? That carried. Uh, next up, we have moved by Brian, seconded by Jim, the uh, Assistant Librarian and Digital Services uh, updates with the uh, from the Evaluation Committee. Did you want to add anything on that? I've just noted in the report that there were a couple changes that the Job Evaluation Committee did recommend, so we've made that in there and that the discussions will carry on into the budget process. Okay, any questions or comments? Brian. Thank you, John. Uh, I note the, uh, the change in the title uh, as recommended by the, uh, the Job Evaluation Committee to put more emphasis on digital services. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, uh, of is the library able to avail themselves of the expertise, the IT expertise that the broader uh, corporation relies on in terms of, uh, you know, troubleshooting and that kind of thing? Um, I, I guess in a simple sentence, why wouldn't the library use the IT services that the township itself relies on, as opposed to going out and hiring more expertise just for the library? Hi, Kayla. Hi, <laughs> I'll take that one. Uh, so it is really for patron support as well. So it's not, it, I mean, that staff person will help other staff people within the library, but it really is to focus on digital services for patrons and running more programs online and trying to update the website and those kinds of tasks that are technical. So if there was an opportunity for the, say, the clerk's department to get some input on a township website update, if, if one was needed, when one's needed, this person might be able to help with that as well, or no? I mean, they would know how to work our website, but generally we have backups for that within the administration office. Okay, thank you. Okay. Dave and then Bart. Yeah, maybe just to put a bit of that in context, like we have a server, but we get Infinity to do the work on that server. The library has a server, we would get Infinity, Infinity does the work on that server. This position would be more supporting um, somebody calling in or, or somebody coming in and saying, I've got a new printer, how do I get it connected to my computer? Or uh, how would I fill out this form? Um, online or, or those type of uh, support type and run, running programs along the line of educating people on the use of computers, internet, tablets, you name it. So it's, it would be a, a support uh, specialist or programming specialist in relation to um, the IT world, joining virtual meetings and supporting people in that fashion. Okay, thank you. Okay, Barbara? Through you, I did want to just add to that, that we, the board did have, the library board did have that, that question as to, you know, why are we hiring a digital support person when, you know, why wouldn't we go with Infinity or whomever is uh, the contract of the day? And the, the position is to support the programming and staff and patrons, as Kayla mentioned first and foremost, but that we did have the conversation at the board that should there be some involved, you know, if, if there was a question from the township or support needed through the township, that that could also, you know, 
be offered on an ad hoc occasional basis. So yes, if, if, if Kayla wanted to run a, an employee program uh, that you know, she could consult with this digital specialist, but that their primary focus will be on providing support to the library and its patrons. Okay, Martin? Yeah, thanks, Barb. Um, yeah, when we talked about it at the board meeting, uh, the infinity that, that the township uses, that's more for definite technical and fixing things. Uh, this uh, new position is basically more the, the human side of all the technology, where they will be uh, looking after uh, all the Facebook uh, programs, all the programs that want to be put on. So it's two sides of the same coin. And yes, if there is something the township needs and he or she has a tech technological expertise, then yeah, as an ad hoc basis, it would be used. So um, it's all good. It, it makes it more rounded for the library, put it that way. And uh, well, uh, through the chair, one question for you, Kayla. I notice it's pay, pay band 12. I should know this. Is that at the very beginning or lower end or where is that on the pay scale? I should know this. I would say it's somewhere in the middle. Between 11 okay, and 13. <laughs> Very good, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Thanks. Yeah, Jason. Um, so all they're going to do is do the digital stuff. Like how much digital stuff would we get now in a week or something? It just seems like it's a uh, pretty vague description of the job for a full-time position I, it seems like a lot of you know it's a lot of money that full-time position if they're just going to be doing I, I don't know how many how much technical stuff is there a week does anybody know that it just seems like a lot of big position for what we talked about there Barb? i'm not sure if kayla wants me to chime in here it's not just the programming and digital. Um, the the library has a, a are striving to ensure that at no time is an employee in the library alone. The health and safety perspective, um, and so this will. I think that's why they've added the assistant librarian. They're going to be a. They're going to provide the counter support they're going to provide other aspects but their expertise will be in helping the other assistant librarians and the patrons with you know putting out the social programming what we have learned what staff have learned through this covid period is that our online presence of virtual programming while it will relax somewhat as we open up, there is definitely a demand for it in our outreach. We can reach more people by offering a, an online presence than we could by having people coming into the library to participate in programming as well. So we don't see the digital services going away. Um, even though COVID, even though the province starts to open up. Uh, Kayla may be able to better elaborate on that, but that is the board's understanding is we don't see the online presence waning or going away entirely, and they will have additional responsibilities over and above that. Kayla, did you want to add anything to that? I think Barb captured it well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have too much more to add. It's just the increased need for technology supports and online presence from the library. Okay, and just to be clear, this is, we're looking today at the, the job description. We're not approving the dollars in the budget to actually hire someone, is that, that's correct? Right. Okay, Jason, you had a follow up. Yeah, no, I understand that. I just it, from what I got from what Barb said, then to me, like, so um, we're having less demand of people coming in, 
but we have to hire another person. So I, I don't know. It just I'm a little leery that we need another person in there full time. And I guess back to the same thing, me watching the dollars. But it just if there's less people coming in, then they should have less work to do in there. That I would think maybe they could handle some more of that. But I understand we're just yeah. in the in the beginning here too. So yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yep. Thanks. If I may Our, clarify. Yep. Through you. Uh, just to clarify, Councillor Rice, right now we don't have as many people coming in because we have reduced hours. But with the growth in our population, the the in the foreseeable future as we open up the library more, we don't anticipate our patron visits to um, decline from what they were pre-COVID. Uh, Post-COVID, we anticipate that returning to normal or actually increasing, um, and our library is such that uh, we've discovered there is, we can reach more people, we, ha we have more growth coming. Uh, we don't anticipate the patron visits to actually decline from the pre-COVID numbers, the in-person visits. That, as soon as we started to open the doors, it, we had people coming in. They, they, they've missed being in the library. But we can see how we can enhance the delivery of that service to more people with an online presence as well as an in-person visit. I hope that explains it. Mm -hmm. And as, as Dave said and Kayla said, this is the first step of, you know, whether or not we approve the position to be hired is still for the budget process and the number of hours that we're, we're proposing. I think Dave wants to elaborate. Yep, thank you, Dave. Yeah, I just want to add to it that, I mean, this will be a budget discussion, maybe, you know, uh, looking at it as to how COVID is gonna uh, get out of the way and let us get back to normal, maybe be a June, July, August, September hiring next year. So that's a whole other discussion and something we push back on from a staff perspective onto the library discussions with staff is uh, that uh, you know the the net increase in, in hours has to be uh, has to be really reviewed and and maybe we need to cut back on casual labor time in order to justify these hours because uh, the discussion right now is is that you'll not likely get anyone with uh, quality to do this job unless we give them. You know, in that 30 to 35 hour range uh, into, you know, getting towards a full time position. So those are discussions that council need to have and, and see if it is really justified at that point in time next year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, is anyone opposed to this motion? And that is carried then. Thank you. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, Clint, let's move on to yours. Uh, 8.5. Lindsay has point... her hand up there. Oh, oh, hi, Lindsay. Uh, no, I was just going to say uh, Clint's logged in, but he is at, a, at an OPPI conference. So between Alicia and I and Dave, we hopefully can uh, answer the questions. But if not, I can uh, text him and he can jump on. Okay, well, I'm just going to pretend that um, he's giving us a little, uh, you know, inspirational talk before each of the files. And, Perfect. And, uh, we'll go from there. So, okay. Um, so uh, it is uh, 8.5.1, moved by Barbara, seconded by uh, Michael, and it's the uh, Cleanmar machining. Are there any questions about this? Barbara. More of a clarification, I did have consult with the planner and was referred to the county. The number um, on the address of 772130 um, is in the middle of addresses that are 773126 and 773154. I don't know, five, four. Uh, the county has verified through an email to me that the address should be 773130, and they have contacted Lisa Wilson to 
get a new sign installed as soon as possible at the county's expense. Okay. Hi, Brian. Hi, Glenn. Oh, you no, a no I was just waving. House? I was just waving at the planner. I just it's yeah. always clear, great to see him. I I wasn't. Yeah. I was probably fairly confident that there's not much going on in a planners conference that he couldn't uh, break himself away from to uh, inform his uh, council. Well, it's a pretty interesting topic. It's actually on economic development post pandemic, so it's pretty interesting. Um, I don't have any comments on my report um, other than uh, I can address any questions you might have. It looks like Mayor Woodbury is frozen. Deputy Mayor Milne, do you want to? Sure, I can jump part? in. Thank Are there you. any questions on that particular report? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, that is carried. On to the bylaw. Uh, I don't have the movers and seconders in front of me, uh, Lindsay. Sorry. That's okay. So I know I so, did get it, but I, I don't have it here in front of me. No, that's okay. The bylaw is moved by Councillor Shipston and seconded by Councillor Rice. Thank you. Any questions or discussion on the bylaw? Seeing none, I'll turn the vote over to the clerk. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Milne. Recorded vote for bylaw 21-128, zoning bylaw amendment for Clemar machining. Uh, Councillor Shipston? Yes. Uh, Mayor Sorry, Woodbury, I'll mark you absent for this vote because you were having some technical difficulties. Yep. Uh, Councillor Rice? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Frew? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. I vote of six to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have moved by Martin, seconded by Jason, the bylaw to go with that. Any discussion on that? <coughs> okay, seeing uh, none. No, Ma Mayor oh, Woodbury, we're on. The... Yeah, we did oh, the okay, bylaw, so, so we're on, we're on 8.5.3. His report wow. for C15-21 Levesque. My computer should shut off more often. You guys went through two of them. That's good. Um, 8.5.3, moved by Michael, seconded by Brian. Uh, that's uh, the next planning report. Good comments, Clay. Anything else you wanted to add to it? No, no, uh, Chair Woodbury. Okay. Good, you had me at no. Um, any questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, is anyone opposed to this motion? And that is carried. I'm on to a new piece of paper. Uh, next is 8.5.4, the bylaw to go with that, and that is moved by Martin, seconded by Barbara. Any discussion on the bylaw? And Lindsay, I'll let you do that one. Thank you, uh, Mayor Woodbury. Recorded vote for bylaw 2021-142, zoning bylaw amendment for Levesque. Uh, Councillor Fru? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay. Uh, next, we move on to 8.5.5. That's planning report 2021-083. Um, moved by Barbara, seconded by Jason. Uh, anything on this one, Clint? Uh, I'll just answer questions. Okay. Are there any questions? Well, good job answering those questions then, Clint, so far. Uh, anyone opposed to this motion? And that will be carried. And the bylaw to go with it is moved by Jason, seconded by Martin. Any discussion on the bylaw? Seeing none, 
Lindsay? Uh, recorded vote called for bylaw 2021-143, zoning bylaw amendment for Barlari. Uh, Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Frew? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. 8.5.7, uh, that's uh, planning report 2021-084, uh, moved by Michael, seconded by Barbara. Okay. No comments. Okay, let's see about questions then. Brian. Just one quick comment. Um, I know a, a while ago Clint had mentioned that he would update the uh, financial implications to a more current. So if, uh, I know he's a busy guy, but uh, the more current numbers would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Mm, seeing none. Uh, anyone opposed? That is carried. Next is the bylaw, moved by Jason, seconded by Michael. Any comments on the bylaw? Okay, Lindsay. Thank you. A recorded vote for bylaw 2021-144, zoning bylaw amendment for Manoa Martin. Uh, Councillor Shipston? Yes. <laughs> Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Frew? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? Okay. I vote a seven to zero, that's carried. Okay. Uh, next we have 8.5.9, moved by Martin, seconded by Jim. And uh, that's on the uh, uh, planning report. Uh, 2021-085, my brain just went into pause um, for a second there. Uh, anything on this one, Clint? Uh, no, um, just to, Brian made a previous comment there. Um, I'll follow up with finance to, to get that done. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from council? Seeing none, anyone opposed to this motion? That is carried. Next, we have the uh, bylaw for it, which is moved by Barbara, seconded by Jason. Any comments on the bylaw? Okay, your turn, Lindsay. <coughs> Reported vote for bylaw 2021-136, the site plan for Manoa and Naomi Martin. Uh, Councillor Frew? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Deputy Mayor Mill? Yay. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. Item 8.5.11, uh, it's uh, Menno Hoover, moved by Jim, seconded by Martin. Uh, anything on this one, Clint? No comment. Okay. Are there comments or questions? Is there anyone opposed to this motion? That is carried. Uh, next is the uh, bylaw to go with it, moved by Jason, seconded by Michael. Comments on the bylaw? Okay, Lindsay, your turn. Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. Recorded vote for bylaw 2021-145, site plan for Menno and Martha Hoover. Uh, Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Frew? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, 
Well, thank you from for taking time away from your really busy planning conference um, that I think you're having at your house anyway. So, uh, and your your comments today were right on the money, Clint. So, uh, thank you. It was easily understood and uh, appreciate all your work. Uh, next, we'll move on to bylaws and motions. Uh, we have one moved by Martin, seconded by Michael. And that is the uh, bylaw 2021-120 Maple Grove Cemetery bylaw. Lindsay? Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. So this, uh, we got approval back from the Bereavement Authority uh, just last week, or the 27th of September. So just bringing it forward. They didn't recommend any changes. They liked our bylaw other than an addition of, I think, one definition, uh, just to clarify. I forget what the exact one was, but we added that definition and uh, now it's here for approval. And uh, Deputy Mayor Milne, I spelt uh, pallbearers correctly. So I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Are, are there any nice. other? <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, now I'm going to have to check that more to see how it's spelled. Now, never mind. Um, is anyone... Oh, good. <laughs> is anyone that opposed to this motion? Oh, you've we'll got to do a record, vote on this one. Yeah, recorded vote. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mayor Woodbury. So, recorded vote for bylaw 2020 the Maple Grove Cemetery bylaw. Uh, Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Councillor Frew? Yes. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Dobreen? In favor. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay. Uh, item 9.2. That's an emergency bylaw for the uh, appointment of emergency management committee and control group, moved by Barbara, seconded by Jason. Did you want to add anything to that one, Lindsay? Uh, this is just a kind of a cleanup on uh, the appointments for the committee and as well as the control group. Uh, RCMC, Derek, uh, the fire chief, and uh, we had a meeting with the uh, emergency committee and just brought some amendments forward that just made it a little bit cleaner and uh, oh, yeah. yeah, that's about it. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Nope. Well, seeing none there, then Lindsay, I'll let, let you do the vote. Thank you, recorded vote for bylaw 2021-139 to appoint uh, the members of the emergency management committee and the control group. Uh, Mayor Woodbury? Yes. Councillor Rice? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Shipston? Yes. Councillor Dobrain? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Councillor Frew? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you receive any notices of motion? None no. Okay, and Brian? I would like to introduce a notice of motion, if I might, Mr. Mayor. Sure. I will I will be working with the clerk's department and bringing forward a notice of motion uh, providing consideration of a community flagpole uh, to be funded in the 2022 budget. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Okay, seeing none, uh, consent items, number 11.1, .1, regular business, moved by Jim and seconded by Martin. Uh, did we have any of those pulled, Lindsay? No? I didn't receive any, no. Okay, and uh, does anyone wish to pull any of those? Okay. Not seeing anyone, so discussion on any of the regular business consult. Consent, not consult. Well, wore everybody out. Martin. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, 
in the in the check register these are just small amounts in a very big pond but uh maybe uh derek can uh, answer this one check number zero four zero six six two sparky's costume at four thousand four hundred ninety one seventy five that's a nice costume but um seemed to be a bit and then uh maybe liam can answer this one check number zero 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 one oh five pitney bows uh the postage automated postage it said fifty six fifty uh dated july twenty fifth i was just wondering if that amount for the postage is six months or uh, a quarterly or whatever. So that's it from there. Okay, Sparky. We'll Sparky, you go first. You should be wearing okay, the costume so for this question. <laughs> so Sparky was purchased. We purchased through the Township of Southgate, and then we reimburse. We write a check from the Dundalk Fire Association to oh, the Township okay. of Southgate for it. So that was purchased by the Firefighters Association check has been written to the township already and that was out of uh donations in memory of norm jack that we bought that oh, costume great i did not know that that's fantastic thank you very appropriate uh for uh norm support of the the department and the fire prevention efforts that that'll help you with uh liam with you, Mr. Mayor, the check to the Pitney Bowes for the 5650, that is a prepaid postage account that we pay into. So our postage machine downloads postage as we need, but we sort of prepay into an account first. So that 5650 is not a specific period. So okay. our, our monthly postage ranges from 1,000 to two on a normal month to like 4,000 on a tax bill per month. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, anyone opposed to the motion? And that is carried. Uh, next, 11.2, uh, the consent for uh, uh, items under correspondence, and that is moved by Brian, seconded by Jason. Um, I didn't have anything pulled for that either. Uh, does anyone want wish to pull anything? Okay, time to comment then on any of these items. Well, we're following Clint's lead on the comments here. This is uh, going through. Um, anyone opposed to this motion? That is carried uh resolutions from other municipalities moved by barbara seconded by uh, michael uh none of these have been pulled anyone wish to pull any okay See, seeing none anyone wish to comment on any of these okay is anyone opposed to that motion and that is carried there is uh, no closed session uh, in, uh, consent items. Um, the uh, county report, uh, I think the, the biggest thing is we're gonna start meeting a hybrid version at the next meeting uh, next week. So uh, we'll see how, how that goes. We know how smooth things go while we're just on computer. So mixing it up as a hybrid is gonna be interesting. Um, <clears throat> Other than that, I, there really wasn't a whole lot going on at the at the last meeting. It was done by lunchtime, and it was just uh, some standard standard stuff. Brian, did you anything you wanted to point out? Just the one thing I wanted to point out there there was a, a delegation from Georgian College, Marilyn uh, mm -hmm. West uh, Moines is the CEO of Georgian College, and they have been uh, authorized by the province to start granting um degrees in bachelor of science uh nursing and that is a very exciting uh development uh because we desperately need more nurses in our region well right across the province really if not the country but, but uh, specifically here in gray bruce we need more nurses and uh, we do know from past uh, past experience that if the nurses do their uh, their work or their training in large urban centers, they tend to stay there because they, they have developed a familiarity and relationships with those large urban uh, caregivers. 
So if we can keep them here and do their training in our hospitals, there's a higher likelihood of them staying. And uh, we uh, very much are excited to do that. There was a request from Georgian College to fund some of the renovations needed at the college to uh, start providing that uh, education or that training. And uh, the county has, uh, has uh, considered it. They haven't approved it yet, but they will consider it. So that is an exciting uh, development uh, at the county level. Yes, that's all. Thank very. You. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, any, any questions or comments about any of this? Hmm. Okay. Um, members privilege. Anybody have anything for members privilege? Jim? Over the weekend, two individuals were arrested for theft from motor vehicles in Dundalk. So the police presence was in Dundalk over the weekend. Yep, thank you. Dave? Just wanted to uh... You let council know yesterday and for public consumption, we have a clinic uh, being scheduled for October 21st between 3 and 7 p.m. And at this point in time, we're looking like we'd be going to the McIntyre building because of inclement weather to do it more inside. Unless the weather's really good, we do it outside. Yeah, that's great. And uh, they were an email I saw, um, they're very pleased with the numbers uh, that we're getting here, uh, turning out for these uh, these pop-up vaccine clinics. So that's very positive. Anyone have anything else? Okay. Um, now it's a quarter past 12. Do you wanna just push through and, uh, and do our closed meeting? stuff or uh, do you want to take a break for a few minutes barb could we move into closed or pass the resolution take a five minute break give us five minutes to get in um just so that we can uh, stretch our legs for a couple of minutes yep yeah i'm just wondering if it if what the general consensus was to is that okay with everybody that We'll just take a yep. quick break. I could okay. I could use a minute to go see a man about a horse. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I have a motion moved by Michael and seconded by Jason for us to go, go into closed session. Uh, any discussion? Okay, anyone opposed? That is carried and uh, call a recess. Uh, it's almost quarter after, so we'll give Brian another minute or two. So we'll come back at 20 after. Thanks. So just, just Mayor Woodbury, we actually yep. have to log off and then yep. log in to a different one, right? That's correct. Thank you. See Thanks. you in a bit.
Miss uh, Martin, I guess. Okay, well, why don't we uh, get started with uh, this back and uh, we'll go from there. Um, 14.1 uh, was uh, personal matters about an identifiable individual. The subject was internal CAO interest staff report HR 2021-023. Um, Moved by Jason, seconded by Barbara. Was that to just accept that report, uh, Lindsay or Kayla? Yeah, I'll defer that to Kayla. Okay, Kayla? Or Dave. Maybe read your motion if it, if it didn't, if it was as stated. Yep, is that to receive that for information? Uh, there was more in the motion. Okay, uh, I, that's sorry, all I have. Okay. Like I had the motion to go into closed, but. Uh, sorry, it was in the report. Um, okay. I'm just trying to bring it back up. I closed it. Yeah, me too. No, oh, here it is. No. Oh. Um, oh yeah, it, it's that uh, a recommendation. The the motion is that be it resolved. Council receives staff report HR 2021-023C for information, and that council uh, discuss internal interest in the upcoming CAO vacancy and the council direct staff to bring an updated CAO succession plan to the October 20th, 2021 council meeting. That's what the motion was. Uh, I would that, was moved, that was moved by uh, Jason, seconded by Barbara. Any discussion on that? Okay, uh, anyone opposed? That is Carrie. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next is moved by Barbara, seconded by Jason, the confirming bylaw. Any comments on that? Okay, Lindsay. I'll, uh... Thank you, Mayor Woodbury. Recorded vote uh, called for the confirming bylaw. Uh, Councillor Fru? Yes. Deputy Mayor Milne? Yay. Councillor Rice? Yes. Councillor Sixton? Yes. Councillor DeBreen? In favor. Councillor Shearson? Yes. Mayor Woodbury? Yes. By a vote of seven to zero, that's carried. Okay. And we have a motion moved by Brian. And uh, nobody will ever guess what this one is. Um, is anyone opposed to us adjourning? <laughs> okay, well, then we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Take care, everyone. Thank you all. Yep. Thanks for all the, the work everybody's put into stuff. Take care. Thank you. Take Bye. Care. Bye. 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 Bye.